tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Jonathan. Angie stuck her head in the kitchen and scanned the room until she spotted me pulling a small sack of sugar from one of the shelves. Mrs. Resnick was looking for you. I think she wants you and Bob to take some stuff down to the dead storage. I sighed as I closed the upper cabinet door from where I pulled the sugar from and turned to face Angie. I'm kind of in the middle of something. Can't you and Bob take care of it? Before she even uttered a word, Angie Lieberman was shaking her head to my undemanding and simple request, her long curly brown hair swaying to the movement. I'm helping Mrs. Resnick with the filing, and lugging things into the basement is a man's job. Are you serious? I began, but her head had already disappeared from the inn's kitchen as suddenly as it had emerged, leaving me with my mouth open and alone. It wasn't like I hated lugging junk into the basement or into the dead storage room, but it always seemed like they conjured these tasks up at the most unsuitable of times. It was bad enough that, being the cook here at the Windward Inn, I was still required to crawl around in a basement while I was in the middle of preparing food, and not to be aware of the numerous sanitary issues that it raised? Come on. Nevertheless, there was no one except Angie, Bob, and I here during this time of the year when it came to the staffing at the inn. Fall was already stretching into October, and most of the guests had already checked out. The Windward Inn was a bed and breakfast owned by Bernie and Josephina Resnick. They had owned the inn since as long as I lived here in town, and I had been working for them for about four or five years now during the busy time of the year, which was pretty much from May until now when I wasn't attending culinary classes at the community college. The inn was situated at the edge of a town and was backed up to the lake. The location was perfect. It was the lake that drew in most of the out-of-towners and kept the town of Florence going with outside financial backings. Like I said, the inn's property stretched into the banks of the lake, and the scenic view of the sun rising and setting over the lake from inside the inn was spectacular. Breakfast from the dining room or out in the back deck at sunrise was something to be experienced, to be truly appreciated. I found myself on many occasions slacking in my duties and just leaning up against the window, enjoying the view. The inn is a large two-story Victorian building that was supposedly built back in the late 1800s and was, and still is, the most desirable place to reside in when staying here in Florence. The eight luxurious rooms here fill up fast during the tourist season, and I consider myself lucky at times that there are only eight rooms. It can get a bit hectic here at times, especially when help is minimal, and it's only Angie, Bob, and I scrambling around trying to maintain some type of order. The Resnicks are always here, and they try to lend a hand when they can, but they're close to their 80s now, so we don't expect them to take on too much of the chores here. Sighing, I untied my apron and tossed it on the counter. There was no sense in trying to start any bacon now, I had decided, and was about to walk out of the kitchen when Bob Goodman's head poked from around the corner. Hey, John, Mrs. Resnick wants us to... He began before I cut him off with a wave of my hand. Yeah, yeah, I know. Angie was just in here. What does she want us to move downstairs? Uh, some boxes with last year's files, detergent, and uh, two chairs for the dead room. Bob always referred to the dead storage room as the dead room for whatever reason. Perhaps it sounded that going down into a place called the dead room was like some undertaking that required only the bravest of volunteers. Or maybe it just sounded cool. Who knows? Bob started here at the end the season before last and was still trying to grasp the daily routines of working here. He was a nice guy, and everyone here took a real liking to him from the get-go. He was a year younger than Angie and I's 26, tall, thin, and wore glasses that always seemed to slide from his face. We left the kitchen area and walked through the adjoining dining room, through the lobby, and halted at the front desk where Angie was sitting behind, typing away at the computer. Despite having a computer to do all the filing for the inn, the Resnicks were firm believers in having those files in black and white as well. 
Something you could hold in your hand and not data in a thumb drive. So where's this stuff going downstairs? I asked. Without pulling her eyes from the screen, she pointed to the door to the office behind her. In the office... Gotcha, I replied with as much enthusiasm that I could muster, and Bob and I walked around the desk counter and into the back office. The office was comprised of two cluttered desks, one for Bernie and the other for his wife, a few mixed-matched filing cabinets, an old General Electric refrigerator, and a small table with a stained coffee maker with cups and assorted condiments lining its surface. Sitting on the floor next to the door to the basement were three cardboard boxes identified by a black marker as 2005 files, a 50-pound plastic bucket of lemon-scented detergent powder, and one of the old office chairs with a white piece of paper taped to its back stating dead storage in the same black marker. I'll take the chair and you grab the detergent. We'll come back up for the files, I said as I opened the basement door and turned on the light switch. The basement was a foundation of large stones and ancient mortar. With the rust-coated pipes running along the ceiling, you had to duck your head in certain areas to avoid a nasty lump on the noggin. Bob can attest to that, as he wasn't a fast learner when navigating his way down here and found out the hard way on a few occasions. The right wall was lined with shelves where supplies and boxes of dust-covered files from the previous years rested. A wall of sheetrock was constructed at the far end to accommodate the laundry room. Two large front-loader washers and dryers sat back there, and we all took turns on the laundry detail, including Angie. With her fear of being down here, though, she mostly persuaded Bob and myself to switch chores. I didn't mind. With the poor lighting down here from bulbs of less wattage than required and a constant chilled dampness, I could see Angie's displeasure of being down here alone. It reminded me of some medieval dungeon. It didn't bother me, though. I'd throw on my headset and fold laundry for hours, enjoying the peaceful bliss to some classic rock. To the left was the door to the dead storage. I was in the process of opening the door when Bob was walking back from placing the detergent in the laundry room. Think there's room in there for that? Bob asked, gesturing to the door. Last time I was in there, the dead room was packed. Well, either way, it's going in, I replied as I opened the door and groped for the light switch on the wall inside. The dead room didn't have a light in the ceiling like most rooms. Instead, an old floor lamp that used to sit in the lobby found its way down here years ago and was now the sole source of light. With the lamp only having one working socket out of the three, the light it cast was as dim as the basements. Before the lamp, we had to use a flashlight. Things were rough back then. My fingers fell upon the switch, and in an instance, the room was poorly illuminated. The lamp stood in the far corner, blocked by a discarded bed frame. The room, as Bob had stated, was packed to the gills. Everything from old furniture that the Resnicks refused to throw out to items left behind by former guests filled the room. A narrow path through this mess was left so we could make our way to the back of the room to stack junk upon more junk. I surveyed the layout of this order for the chair's final resting place. Told ya, Bob commented as he stood next to me and scanned the room with his hands on his hips. I rubbed my chin as my eyes moved from one pile of fittings to the next. Yeah, this place gets smaller and smaller every time I come in here. As I tried to determine a suitable spot for the chair, Bob had casually moved down the narrow path to the back of the room, touching and inspecting various items as he went, like a collector in an antique show. It wasn't until he was at the back of the room that something had caught his attention and caused him to stop and bend down. I don't recall seeing this before. He stated more to himself, but was intended for me to acknowledge. I blocked any acknowledgement until he spoke again. Yeah, hear me, John. You ever seen this trunk before? I sighed and made my way through the tight passageway to where he was kneeling. Before I was at his side, he was already pulling the trunk from beneath the table from where it was hidden. It was a large wooden trunk whose worn faded leather exterior was torn in several places, exposing the birch wood underneath. It had to be about 20 inches high and covered by dust. 
There's a guest tag name on it, I said and pointed to the faded yellow tag that was tied to the trunk's padlock. Bob wiped the dust from his hands on his pant legs and lifted the tag so he could read its inscription. It says, Room Number 8, Malloy, 1986. 1986? Wow! I can't believe it's been down here that long, I replied. Bob dropped the tag and was now examining the primitive padlock that secured the trunk. It's kinda heavy. I wonder what's inside. If no one has claimed it by now, chances are they never will, right? I suppose not. Why? I'm going to try to open it. Who knows what's inside this thing? He was now pulling at the lock. Well, I tell you what. Why don't you put the chair up when you're done and I'll go bring the files down, okay? Yeah, yeah, sure, he replied, not fully grasping what I had just suggested. He was now pulling a red pocket knife from his back pocket and unfolding the blade, his undivided attention fixed on the lock. Okay, then. I'll leave you to that, I said, and made my way back to the front of the room. I had some baking to do, and this was throwing a wrench in my schedule. I had taken the boxes of files down one at a time and slid them onto the shelves in their periodic order next to their older brethren when I heard Bob call out from the dead room. John, I got the lock open. His voice was excited as the time he returned from watching Revenge of the Sith at the Florence Theater. Nice, I called back as I started making my way back up the stairs. Let me know if you find anything worth mentioning. I'm heading back up. There was no reply, so it was safe to assume he didn't hear me or was preoccupied with the contents of the old trunk. I shook my head and smiled as I climbed the stairs. Jonathan, where's Bob? <gasps> Angie's sudden voice scaring the bejesus out of me as I prepared to put a couple of apple pies in the oven. Jesus Christ, Ange! Are you trying to give me a heart attack? I closed the oven door and turned to face her. She stood leaning in the kitchen's doorway, smiling. The Resnicks are leaving and we're asking where Bob was. You saw him last. I checked my watch. It was 5.46. It was just after 2 when we took the stuff into the basement. He hasn't come up from the basement yet? You tell me. I was just giving you a heads up that the bosses were looking for him. Angie folded her arms across her chest and watched me, waiting for an answer. It was times like these that I usually reminded her she wasn't my boss, but decided to refrain from engaging in any pissing contest for the time being. Instead, I shook my head, hissed, and walked past her. Damn it, Bob, I thought as I walked through the end to the basement door. When I reached the office, I opened the basement door and peered down the stairs. The light downstairs was still on. Damn you, Bob. I descended the stairs heavily. Bob! What the hell, man? No response. When I reached the basement cement floor, I instantly noticed that the door to the dead storage was closed. I paused at the unexpected sight. I was sure that he would still be in there. Bob! I opened the door to find the lights were still on. The office chair with the paper dead storage taped to it stood exactly where I had left it three hours earlier. Bob? I stepped into the room and looked about. No sign of him. I threw a glance down the aisle and saw the trunk still out from under the table. The lid was closed and its lock laid on the floor nearby in the open position. Bob? I said aloud again as if he was nearby and didn't hear me call for him initially. I shrugged, as any notion to his whereabouts were now discarded by the room being empty. It was as if he simply vanished or walked off without saying a word. Before I left, I maneuvered some of the furniture around and slid the office chair out of the way. I threw another glance at the trunk sitting alone at the end of the aisle and shrugged once more before turning off the light and leaving the room. Before going back up, I poked my head in the laundry room just in case. Nothing. As I rounded the stairs back up to the office, Angie appeared in the doorway. Don't forget you have pies in the oven. Was he down there? I squeezed past her as I entered the office and checked my watch. I still had about 25 minutes before the pies needed to be pulled out. Well? She asked. 
Oh, no, he wasn't. It's like he just vanished. He was down there picking the lock on some old trunk he found down there when I left him. But that was like three hours ago. Well, the Resnick's left already, she said as she stared down the steps into the dark of the basement. We have two guests checking out. Mr. West is leaving in a few, and Ms. Rigney is the last to go tomorrow morning. Well, do me a favor and call up Ms. Rigney and see if she's going to be having dinner anytime soon. I'm going to close up the kitchen soon. Angie turned her gaze away from the basement stairs. What trunk? We were putting that chair in the dead room, and he found this trunk that belonged to some guest like 20 years ago. He was set on picking the lock and seeing what was inside. Well? Well what? What did he find in it? I shrugged. How should I know? I left while he was still picking it. I paused for a moment, thinking. What? I just remembered that the lock was laying on the floor when I just left there. And you didn't check to see what was inside? She inquired as if I was some child who should have known better than to stick my hand in an open flame. No, I... Jonathan, really? That trunk could have been filled with cash and Bob just loaded his pockets up and split. I, I didn't... Let's go look. Let me take the pies out of the oven first. Even though I doubt that the trunk was filled with cash, I'll agree with you that I probably should have seen what was in there, I said over my shoulder as we descended the stairs into the basement. Why else would he just take off? He probably found something in there that was valuable as hell and took it home. Though Angie's theory would explain why Bob had suddenly called it quits and left, she didn't know Bob like I did. He would have been too scared to just leave without saying a word to anyone, especially me. Angie? Sure. She had the usual tendency to be a little too bossy towards him. But me? He would have filled me in. Oh yeah, he most definitely would have. Watch your head, I advised her as she barely missed a low-hanging elbow joint. Did you ask Mrs. Rigby about dinner while I was getting the pies? I asked as I turned the doorknob to the dead storage and pushed it open. Shit, I forgot all about her. She'll be fine. Uh-huh. Famous last words. Again, I searched for the switch and the room once again illuminated in a dull yellowish glow. With Angie practically joined at my hip, I entered the room and pointed to the trunk at the far end of the aisle. There it is. Angie, finding the renewed courage of being in the basement, slid past me and crept to the trunk. She took a knee next to it and examined the guest tag. Malloy, 1986, she said aloud. She then turned to look at me, biting her lower lip as if to say, Wish me luck, here goes nothing. And with that, she turned her attention back to the trunk and slowly opened the lid. The lid fell aside on its hinges, exposing its contents within. I couldn't see from where I stood with Angie's back blocking my view, and I heard her gasp as she flinched backwards. I took a step closer when Angie fell backwards on her ass, giving me a full view now of what was inside. At first, I couldn't make heads or tails of what I was looking at. Something of a whitish color seemed to be crammed into the trunk, like linen and pillows. It looked like it was in pieces, whatever it was. Then it moved. A piece of it poked up from the trunk. Then another piece popped up as it seemed something inside was alive and now moving. As a larger piece of this form arose, it was evident that whatever had been inside this trunk was now unfolding itself as it laboriously pulled itself free from its cramped quarters. It froze me to the spot as I watched. Like some Lufkin folding ruler, it slowly opened up and developed into some type of humanoid shape that rose higher and higher from the restricted confines of the trunk. I felt Angie bump into my legs and look down. She was attempting to scramble backwards like a crab from the nightmare emerging in front of us. It blocked the light from the lamp out, and I looked up to the shape that had risen from its container and was forming. The creature stood tall inside the trunk. Its head was now touching the ceiling, and it stooped as it continued to grow. The creature was of giant humanoid proportions. Its white leathery skin hung loosely from its elongated body, and its protruding rib cage was prominent beneath its skin, like that of a starved dog. 
Its limbs were thin and long. The hands, however, were overly large with long red talon-like fingers. The head was like a lengthened skull. Strands of long gray hair hung to its shoulders. Its lidless eyes large, bulbous, and black. Its mouth resembling that of some Venus flytrap, its red teeth long and pointed were integrated as they jutted outward. It was as if my feet had been glued firmly to the floor. Even as I felt Angie pushing against my legs to get further away from the horror that was manifesting itself before our very eyes, my feet remained rooted, my legs unyielding. I felt my bladder shiver inside of me, and I hoped I wouldn't piss myself. Not with Angie right there. Not with the back of her head pressed against my crotch. The horror from the trunk nonchalantly reached out ever so carefully and grabbed Angie by her calf, its massive hands easily grabbing a firm hold around her leg. A whimper escaped her lips as it pulled her away from me. As she slid from my legs, she looked up to me, her eyes filled with tears, her lips quivering as she attempted to say my name. Her hands frantically reached out to me as she tried to grab onto me and my clothing as an anchor. Her fingers found no grip and slid from my pants. Like she was some child's doll, the horror lifted her in the air by her leg and held her dangling body in front of it. Still, Angie did not scream out. She only hung there upside down like some squirming worm impaled on a fisherman's hook. Her blouse fell over her head, exposing her bare torso and black lace bra. I opened my mouth. To say what, I have no idea, but I seemed so small and helpless at that moment. I stood rooted to the floor with fright as Angie was being taken by this nameless horror, and I could do nothing to intervene. No shouts for help. No attempt to free her. Nothing. The horror pulled her body close embracing it like a child would a stuffed animal. Holding it close to its bosom, its long pale arms wrapped around her constricting flailing movements. It was then Angie bawled loudly and wailed. Jonathan! She cried out. The horror then extended its skull head out toward me and opened its gaping maw in a growl like hiss. As if to warn me that any rescue at this point was futile and to back away from what now rightfully belonged to it. It was then that I uprooted my feet and my legs awakened from their paralysis. I turned and ran from the room with the sound of Angie's muffled cries as she called out my name behind me. I ran from that room in a blind panic, like someone fleeing from a burning movie theater, rushing to the nearest exit without concern for anything or anyone except the way out. It was in my hasty retreat for the stairs and back up to the office that the same elbow joint I had warned Angie about caught me square in the head, and in an instance of blinding white, the room went black. My hearing was the first to awaken from my unfortunate and forced slumber. The surrounding voices were faint and distorted at first. I think he's waking up, said a woman's concerned voice. Can you hear me, kid? A man's voice now inquired. Before my eyes even opened, I felt the throbbing pain in my head. It reminded me of a tequila hangover I once had two years ago at Jimmy Doyle's party that had rendered me helpless for a day and a half. I went to reach for my forehead, and I felt the soft hand block my own and gently guide it back to my side. You've had a nasty hit to the head. We took the liberty of calling an ambulance since no one else was around, the woman stated. My eyelids parted, and the light immediately caused a bolt of pain to rack my skull. I moaned and tried to touch my forehead again, only to have it redirected to my side. You mustn't touch it, the woman said. As I slowly forced my eyes open and take in my surroundings, I realized that I was lying on the floor to the office upstairs. Standing at my feet was a tall man in his early fifties. He was dressed in a gray suit, and his graying hair was slicked back over his head. He reminded me of the actor Christopher Lee. I then placed him as Mr. West in room number three. 
I came to check out and didn't find anyone about, Wes began. I then bumped into Ms. Rigney here, and we took it upon ourselves to look around for someone. It's a good thing we did. We found you knocked out cold on the basement floor. We guessed that you hit your head on one of the pipes down there in the ceiling. It was Rigney who now spoke. Do you remember hitting the pipe? Where's the other staff at? We looked all over the inn and couldn't find a soul. I turned to look at Miss Rigney who was kneeling at my head. The brightness of her flowered dress caused me to wince in pain, and I saw that the front of the dress was hanging open, granting me a full view of her ample C-cup breasts hanging inches from my face. Those voluptuous breasts momentarily caused me to forget why I was lying on the floor to begin with, but now her beautiful cans were now being swept aside, and the image of that thing rising from the trunk came back to me all too vividly. Angie! I said, and tried to sit up. A wave of dizziness washed over me, and I felt a twinge of nausea. Rigney eased me back down to a folded end towel that had been placed under my head as a pillow. Who? She asked. I believe it's the young woman who works at the front desk, stated West. Where is everyone, kid? Laying in the prone position on my back, I raised my hand and pointed to the open basement door. It has her. And the thing in dead storage took her. Thing? Asked Rigney. What thing? We saw no one else down there, added West. In dead storage. In the trunk, I said before closing my eyes with a moan. The nausea seemed to be getting worse, just like that tequila hangover. Perhaps he means that door on the left down there? Rigney said as she stood up and straightened her dress. West was already descending the stairs and Rigney followed. <sighs> Don't go in there. I weakly warned them as they were leaving the office. <sighs> it's in the trunk. Ms. Rigney paused and looked over her shoulder to me. You just lay there and try not to move. The ambulance will be here soon. We'll see if your friend is down there. And with that, the beautiful Ms. Rigney with her flowered dress and huge breasts disappeared down the basement stairs. There was nothing I could have done to stop them. I was physically too banged up to get on my feet and prevent them from going down there, and my mind still wasn't at 100% to convince them of the horror that was awaiting them in the dead storage. What could I have possibly said? Don't go in there. There's this giant of a monster that lives in a trunk that's ten times too big for it to fit into. Yet it can and does. No, that would never do. Perhaps I had somehow imagined the whole ordeal. Perhaps when West and Rigney went down there, they would find Bob and Angie rummaging through some former guest's belongings, and all would be back as it was. I was persuading myself that what I saw down there in that room was not the truth but some induced nightmare caused by the bump on my head. I had almost convinced myself that until I heard the muffled screams from somewhere down in the basement. I could feel their blood-curdling cries for help vibrate up through the floor beneath me. They continued briefly for a moment, then fell silent as they had most likely met the same fate as Bob and Angie had. I pictured the horror reaching out and grabbing the two lifting them up high and devouring them before it squirmed back into the tight quarters of its abode. I laid there on that office floor thinking of what that thing could possibly be and why it was in that trunk. Who was Malloy? And was that person even aware of what that trunk contained? I lay there staring at the stained tiled ceiling of that office until two paramedics entered the inn and found me here in the back room. When they asked where the people were who called in about my injury, I didn't bother trying to go through the whole spiel about Bob finding the trunk, or Angie opening it with me there, or even that Mr. West and Miss Rigney were now dead. Nah, why bother? I just pointed to the basement door and simply said, dead storage. One paramedic went down there a little while ago, and the other one is still dressing the wound on my head. It didn't take too long for that guy to find the trunk, because his scream started up and the other guy is leaving me now and running down there to see what's going on. He will see it all right, 
and then some. Think I'll just lay here a bit longer until this nausea passes and get up and head back home, and possibly convince myself that this blow to my head had caused me to hallucinate all of this. Maybe bust out a bottle of booze and hopefully wash everything away. There was no way I could sanely accept everything that happened today without going off the deep end permanently. No, I couldn't have that. Best to just drink myself blind and consider myself laid off and to never mention the events that took place in the dead storage room ever again, leaving the thing in the trunk to anyone else who makes the same mistake I did. Shorty Small, a man neither short nor small, sat in the far corner of the coffee shop, his back to a wall. He was, for a change, the first one to arrive for a hastily arranged meeting with Homer LaCroix. With a half-empty mug of coffee and the powdered sugar remains of two beignets, he watched with amusement as Homer burst through the door. Normally, Shorty arrived late to these meetings after Homer chose the table. Not today. How'd you get here so fast, Shorty? New Orleans hoodoo. That's not funny, particularly today. Did you eat my beignet? I was hungry and you were late. LaCroix looked around for a waitress and motioned for a cup of coffee. When she arrived and placed the mug in front of him, he asked, Would you be a love and bring me one of those luscious beignets and put it on Shorty's bill? Sure, hon, but Shorty's already settled his. I'll start one for you. She hurried away. Small smiled and waited until LaCroix had taken a bite of his beignet before he asked, It's time for you to tell me what the goddamned emergency is, Homer. With a mouthful of powdered sugar and pastry, LaCroix shook his head and held up his hand. After a quick swallow, he said, Damn shorty, couldn't you have at least waited until I had a chance to enjoy it? No. With blank eyes, Small stared at his contact from the tourism board. What the hell? was so important, you dragged me down here at this ungodly hour. It's nine in the morning, Shorty. Half the day is gone. Not in Shorty Small's world. Okay, he took another bite of his beignet. You ever heard of a lycanthrope? Small shook his head. Didn't think so. You ever hear of a werewolf? With a roll of his eyes, Small groaned. Homer, not this shit again. Hey, yeah. Burying his head in his hands, Small remained silent for a moment. I asked for this when I agreed to move to New Orleans, didn't I? Yes, you did. Are you going to tell me what a lycanthrope is? That's the plan. Taking a sip of his coffee, Small grimaced. Wait, I've got to have a warm-up. Five minutes later, his small sipped hot coffee and LaCroix sat in front of him with his hands clasped. He said, What do you think, Shorty? I think everyone in this damn town is certifiably crazy. Doesn't negate the fact we have a mutilated body found in the swamp. Sounds like a job for the police. One would think so, but they're saying it's a gator. Small rolled his eyes. A gator would have dragged it to the bottom of the swamp and let it tenderize. Exactly. So they're blowing it off like usual. They are. Taking a deep breath, Small asked, What does the tourism board want? Glad you asked. They want you to find a lycanthrope and destroy it. I don't even know what a lycanthrope looks like. LaCroix sipped coffee. It's a werewolf with superpowers. All Small could do was shake his head and say, Jeez, not this shit again. Claire Honoré smiled and leaned against the entrance to the third floor of her building. She watched as the big man measured a two-by-four twice before pulling the trigger on a circular saw to make a cut. When the saw's noise subsided, she said, Why do you measure the board twice? Shorty turned. Something my uncle taught me when I was young. Measured twice and cut once. She moved closer to him and surveyed his work on the remodel. 
You've made a lot of progress in the last week. It's starting to look like an apartment. Couple more weeks and you won't recognize the place. Her expression grew serious. What did Homer want? The powers that be want me to look into something. Every time the tourism board wants you to look into something, it's because nobody else will. What is it this time? What's a lycanthrope? Her eyes widened. Sure they. I forbid you to do so. You'll be killed. Rolling his eyes, the big man took her into an embrace. I'm sure nothing is going to happen, Claire. It's a bunch of mumbo-jumbo about a New Orleans mythological creature. Besides, I'm being offered 20000 to check it out. She placed her head on his chest. After a sigh, she looked up at him. They are not myths. You've heard of a werewolf, right? Ah, oh, good grief. She broke from his embrace and glared at him as she folded her arms. Well, have you? Not since I was a kid and had the crap scared out of me when I saw Lon Chaney Jr. turn into a wolfman in an old movie on TV. She nodded. The wolfman. I saw it too. That was a werewolf. A legend from Europe. Okay, so what's a lycanthrope? We call it Rougarou here in New Orleans. They are smarter, stronger, and harder to kill than a mere werewolf. Small again rolled his eyes, shook his head, and walked back to the sawhorses he used as a workstation. Claire, don't tell me you believe all this claptrap. They're merely stories to scare little children into behaving. How many nights have you spent in the bayou? None. Then you've never heard a howl that is not a man, dog, or coyote. There are no wolves in the bayou, but the sound it makes will pierce your soul. Witnesses describe it as half man and half dog standing erect on two legs, covered in hair with the face of a canine. Claire, have you heard this so-called wolf man? Only once. My father and I were fishing one evening and stayed on the water too long. And? We heard its cry and my father's eyes grew round as saucers and his head swiveled searching for the source. He told me to lie on the bottom of our skiff and not make a sound. Then he paddled back to the dock as fast as he could. We only heard it once, but that was enough to scare him. He sold our small boat, and we never went fishing in the bayou again. Let me guess, there was a full moon. Yes, there was. That's the only time of the month my father would fish at night. So, like a werewolf, the full moon supposedly brings them out? She shook her head. No, I'm not an expert, but I've heard that's not the case. So, who could answer my questions? Why not talk to Dr. Fowler at Tulane? Carmen Fowler, PhD in anthropology at Tulane University and a self-proclaimed student of New Orleans history, smiled as Shorty Small appeared in the open door of her office. It's a pleasure to see you again, Shorty. What's it been, four months since our last visit? Yes, ma'am, at least. Thank you for seeing me on such short notice. I enjoyed our last conversation. Did you take care of your walking stick problem? Uh, let's say it's no longer an issue. Good. Come sit with me at my table. We can talk. They settled across from each other and she continued. What's on your mind today? I need to know as much as possible about something called a Rougarou. Tourism board again? Yes, ma'am. Well. The legend dates back to the 16th century and appears in medieval French folklore under the name Lou Gahou. Lou is the French word for wolf and Gahou roughly translates to man. The word became mangled and now is referred to as Rougarou by local Cajuns. The creature supposedly stalks its prey in the fields, forests, and bayous throughout Acadiana and the greater New Orleans area. What is Acadiana? It's the region of southernmost Louisiana, of which New Orleans is a major population center. First time I've heard it identified that way. She chuckled. I'm not surprised. This part of the state is full of legends and monsters. The Native Americans around here recognize the Rougarou as a sacred being who is in harmony with the energies of Mother Earth. Huh. He paused. What does it supposedly look like? 
The professor stood and went to one of the many bookshelves in her office. She found the object she sought and returned to her small conference table. She opened the volume to a marked page and turned it around so he could view the picture. This is a common depiction of the creature. Huh. Small studied the portrait. Looks like all the pictures I've seen of werewolves. Yes, with some subtle differences. Such as? The body appears more human and stands on two legs. Shaggy brown or black hair covers the body and the head is said to be more canine with a long snout. Plus, they stand seven to eight feet in height. The elongated snout is full of razor sharp teeth and some accounts claim they have four toes on their feet like a wolf. Small picked up the book to study the picture closer. Do they only eat humans? She chuckled. No, they have a ravenous appetite for raw flesh. Goats, cows, horses, and even swamp rats are fair game. He laid the book down. What does the legend say about how a human becomes a Rougarou? Depends on who you talk to. If you talk to Catholics, you become a Rougarou if a man does not celebrate Lent for seven straight years. She displayed a wide grin. Okay, I got it. Go to church or you become a Rougarou. She nodded. What else? It is said that the curse can be passed on to a third child of an afflicted man. The beast can change at will and not necessarily on a full moon. But there are numerous variations of the story. My favorite is if a man angers a Native American shaman by abusing the bayou and using the swamps for his own personal gain, then the shaman will put a curse on that person. How is the curse reversed? The legends say if a man were to draw the blood of a Rougarou, say with the knife, the sight of its own blood would break the spell, but this would be a perilous method. We are told the creature possess supernatural strength and speed. Great. What else? They are terrified of flames. Anything else? Decapitating the creature is said to kill it. If you can catch it. There is that, Shorty. He stood. So if there is such a creature, I would find it in the bayou? Yes, at night. Only at night? She nodded. Uh, I've never been in the bayou. Find a guide. Otherwise, you'll never find your way out. That's not something I want to do. Know anyone? She handed him a business card. Yes, he's my cousin. You two should get along well. Off a major highway south of New Orleans, Small turned his Ford Escape onto a twisting gravel road designed to avoid the numerous pockets of open water in the area. Following his GPS, he soon arrived at an older structure built 10 feet off the ground with the use of solid wood pillars. Numerous docks floated in the open water behind. The building, with weathered cypress siding, possessed a sign to the left of the front door, proclaiming it the home of Bayou Adventures. After placing the SUV in park, he stepped out and saw an elderly man making his way toward the parking area. As he grew closer, the man waved and said, You showed a smile? Yes. Henry Dumont shook the hand of the big man. Your pants picked the name when you were a baby, didn't they? No one can pronounce my first name, so I go by Shorty. My overeducated cousin said you had a job for me. Depends. What do you charge for a night on the bayou? Fishing? More like hunting. Huh. He narrowed his eyes and studied small for a few moments. What you hunting? Rougarou. Dumont laughed out loud. Didn't figure you'd be a tourist. I'm not. How much per night? The Rougarou is a myth. Only tourists want to find them. But you know they exist, don't you? Didn't say that. You didn't have to. Dumont turned his head, leaned over and spit a brownish wad of something onto the ground. She said you was quick. Did she also tell you I work for the tourism board? Dumont tucked his thumbs in the suspender straps of his faded denim overalls. She might have mentioned something along those lines. He paused for a moment. How much they paying you? Enough. Okay, five hundred a night. Four. Dumont tilted his head and closed one eye as he studied small. 
four and a half plus we only stay out from dark till two in the morning. Deal. When do we start? That's up to you. Small looked around and then returned his attention to the wafer thin Cajun. What do I need? Long pants and shirt plus a ton of bug spray. Tomorrow night. Be here at seven. The sun barely showed above the western horizon as Shorty Small and Henry Dumont sped across an open span of water in Bayou Perot. Small sat in the front of the airboat with Dumont steering. Having turned his Chicago Cubs ball cap backward, the wind felt good after a long, hot, and humid day. Talking with Cajun behind him remained impossible as the aircraft engine propelled them along at 50 miles per hour. Dumont slowed the boat as they approached a swamp. Bald cypress and tupelo trees could be seen crowded together as the light faded and they neared the swamp's edge. Dumont said, Once we get into the trees, keep your eyes open for gators. Their eyes will reflect the light from the waxing gibbous moon. The what? Almost full moon. Got it. Small held a Remington 1100 with both hands. The shotgun rested on his lap as he searched the murky water for signs of life. Dumont shut off the engine and they drifted in silence. The sound of cicadas dominated the background noise broken only by the screech of birds and the growl of an alligator far off in the distance. The moon played hide-and-seek through the canopy of leaves overhead as the flat-bottomed boat drifted in the still water. Dumont whispered, Did you hear it? The gator? Yeah, it's off to our right by a hundred yards. I won't ask how you know. With a chuckle, Dumont lowered the boat's electric trolling motor into the murky water and slowly maneuvered the craft between the swollen roots of the surrounding trees. Occasionally, he would switch it off and let the boat drift. Moonlight bathed the area in a surreal glow, creating a world of various shades of gray. Small swiveled his head, searching for movement. He saw none. This was the pattern Dumont followed for the next several hours. Use the trolling motor for a few hundred yards and then allow the flat-bottom boat to drift for a while. The quietness of the small motor allowed the men to hear the natural sounds emanating from the surreal backdrop. Neither spoke during this period. Small's past life trained him to be still as he tracked his marks. Dumont's life as a guide through the bayou instilling a need for silence. Dumont said in a whisper, Damn, you're a quiet man. I never had no one in his boat that hasn't been nervous and a constant talker. Nothing to say. I appreciate it. Off in the distance, its direction masked by echoes bouncing off nearby trees, a lonesome howl filled the air. Small swiveled his head again to try to locate the direction. Less than a minute later, they heard it again. Small pointed to their right. What's that way? Mall Swamp. Can you move us in that direction? I can, but it won't be there when we arrive. Besides, that was a coyote. Didn't sound like any coyote I've ever heard. Right, you, being from Chicago, know what coyotes sound like. Grew up in cattle country out west. Learned how to shoot by hunting coyotes from the bed of a moving pickup. We any good? I held my own. Dumont used the small electric motor to steer the airboat in the direction of the sound. After a few minutes passed, he stopped and listened to the noise emanating from the swamp. The boat remained perfectly still in the calm waters. The scent of rotting flesh attacked their noses. Dumont spoke in a soft voice. Something big died here. Small nodded, his concentration on a moving dark shadow 50 yards in front of them. In a soft tone, he asked, You got a flashlight? Got something better. He handed Small a portable spotlight plugged into an auxiliary power outlet on the boat's helm. Wait till I get my shotgun ready. Light it up when I say go. Holding the spotlight out at arm's length away from the boat, Small waited for Dumont's signal. Now! The powerful beam swept the bank in question and the two men saw the half-devoured torso of another human. Bent over and tearing at the carcass, they saw the creature responsible for the man's demise. Turning toward them, its eyes glowed bright red in the light. With a snarl, it reared back on hind legs, bared its bloody fangs, and let out an unearthly howl. Dumont's shotgun roared as Small positioned the spotlight so he could use his own weapon. By the time he accomplished the task, the creature had vanished into the darkness of the wetlands. Did you hit it? Don't know, shorty. 
Never seen anything like that. The scream of a wounded animal could be heard retreating from their position. Kinda sounds like I did. Small gave Dumont a grim smile. That was not a coyote. By the time first responders reached the scene, the first hints of dawn lightened the eastern sky. Both Dumont and Small decided staying close to the body would be the only way they would ever know who the victim might be. What were you two doing out here last night? Dumont smiled at Orleans Parish Deputy Sheriff Billy Dennis. Gigging for flounder? The officer nodded as he looked over the interior of the airboat. Doesn't look like you had much luck. No, sir. What time did you find a body? Turning to the big man, Dumont asked, Can you answer that one, shorty? Close to midnight. The officer looked at the large man and tipped his hat back on his head. You're short as small, aren't you? Yes, sir. I thought so. Weren't you the guy who caused all that trouble earlier this year about a so-called witch running around Bourbon Street? Not sure what you're talking about, deputy. Small changed the subject. Who was the victim? He was one of your kind, Henry. A guy. You probably know him. Willie Johnson. Dumont frowned. Willie disappeared a week ago. You think that was him? Working theory. Why? Tattoo. Willie had a big gator inked on his leg. So did the body. Damn, not too many folks around here had a tattoo like Willie's. Small asked. No ID on the body, deputy? Dennis shook his head. None. We haven't found a skull either. Dumont tilted his head. What do you think did this, Billy? Gator. Both Dumont and Small nodded. By noon, Small had taken a quick nap and parked himself in front of a phone at the tourism board's offices. With the knowledge gained from another chat with Dr. Fowler, he started calling local hospitals and urgent care facilities in the New Orleans area. According to the good doctor, the creature would now be in human form and wounded. If so, whoever the poor soul was, it might have sought treatment somewhere. He called all of the hospitals and drew near the end of the urgent care list when he found a possibility. Orleans Parish Urgent Care, how can we help you? Yes, this is Sergeant Largesse with the Sheriff's Department. We're looking for a possible gunshot wound victim. They would have come in sometime this morning. Let me check, Sergeant. Small heard long fingernails clicking on a keyboard. Ah, yes, here we are. I thought it sounded familiar. We had a white male, age 39, arrived this morning at 6.15, multiple shotgun pellets embedded in his left shoulder. Did he say how he got the wound? Said he was preparing to clean the shotgun and it accidentally went off. He was lucky. A few inches to the right and the outcome would have been different. Did your clinic report this to the police? Uh, let me see. Yes, we filled the proper paperwork with the NOPD. Huh. We haven't received a copy yet. Can you tell me the man's name and address? She did. Thank you, Ms. Uh, I didn't catch your name. Missy Clark. Thank you, Ms. Clark. I appreciate your helpfulness. Replacing the receiver in the phone's cradle, Small stood and headed for his SUV. Using the GPS function on his cell phone, he drove by the location given to the clinic. The address turned out to be a vacant lot between two newly renovated homes in the Hurricane Katrina devastated Lower Ninth Ward. He stopped and took a picture of the lot with his cell phone and headed back to the apartment he shared with Claire Honoré. Two days later, Henry Dumont listened to Shorty Small's summary of the past two days. When he finished, the Cajun hooked his thumbs into the front suspenders of his bib overalls, turned his head, and spat out a wad of tobacco. Damn, son, you've been busy. The retired hitman only nodded. So you think this person's name is Mark Petra? I think there's a strong possibility he's our Rougarou. Because he's half Choctaw and half Cajun? And he used to live at the address in the Ninth Ward that's now a vacant field. Aren't you kind of stretching the packs a bit, shorty? Your cousin, Dr. Fowler, found a reference to him being a registered shaman. That don't mean he's a Rougarou. No, but there is no record of him having a permanent address in New Orleans anymore. 
Maybe he doesn't live here now. Then why does someone pick up his mail on a weekly basis at a post office box in the Ninth Ward? How do you know that? Because here's an image from the security camera at the post office showing a man doing so. Small offered a greeny black and white photo of a man opening a box. The timestamp on the picture read 9.34 p.m. Huh. You sure you ain't a detective from Chicago? Positive. Kind of hard to tell what he looks like from this photo. I agree, but it's the only one I could find, and no one from his neighborhood has seen him since Hurricane Katrina. Two of them told me the man in the picture resembles Mark. Katrina was a long time ago, shorty. I'm aware of that, Henry. Okay, I'd have to agree. Sounds like a good candidate. Dumont paused for a moment and stuck another chew in his mouth. So what now? We go back into the bayou tonight. I was afraid you'd say that. My price went up to 500 a day. For five nights, their efforts to locate the Rougarou again were met with no new signs of the creature. Dumont guided the two through the swamp, choosing different locations each night. Weary and tired from staying out till 2 a.m., Small called a halt to their efforts. The next morning, he lay in bed, his hands behind his head staring at the ceiling. Claire appeared in the bedroom and placed a cup of coffee next to him on his nightstand. You look tired. Frustrated more than anything. Maybe you two are looking in the wrong place. The thought has occurred to me. She sat on the edge of the bed next to him. Her loose robe gapped open, exposing bare skin to his gaze. A smile came to his lips. She sipped on her cup of coffee. I saw a reporter on the late news last night talking about cattle being found dead north of New Orleans. They think a wolf may be responsible. With a raised eyebrow, Small's attention turned to her eyes, not her breasts. Exactly where did this occur? North of here, near Covington. How far is Covington from New Orleans? About an hour or less north over the causeway. Huh. His attention returning to her open robe. I've got an idea. He slipped the robe off her shoulders and drew her into an embrace. The drive over the Lake Pontchartrain Causeway, the longest bridge in the United States, took close to 25 minutes. He arrived at the ranch where the mutilated cattle were discovered around noon. After identifying himself with a business card as a consultant for the tourism board, he asked the rancher to show him where the incident occurred. Hugh Bailey, a man in his early 60s, studied the business card and then asked, Short is small, huh? You don't look anything like your name. I've been told that. Why is a New Orleans tourism board interested in a wolf attack here in St. Tammany Parish? In a slight variation of the truth, Small said, There has been a similar attack by what is suspected to be a wolf out in the bayou. I have been asked to see if the attacks on your herd could be by the same animal. We don't get many wolves in this here part of the world. How are you going to determine if it is? Before I moved here, I lived in Montana. I've tracked many a wolf in my day. Well, if you can figure this out, more power to you. We'll take my pickup. Fifteen minutes later, Small knelt by the spot where the rancher said he found the slaughtered cow. Looking up, the big man asked, How many? What do you mean, how many? How many other head of cattle have you lost? Bailey grew quiet as he stared at the ground. Uh, this will be the fifth. Over how long a period? A little under a year. He paused and returned his attention to Small. Haven't had an incident in a long time. I was losing one a month, but they stopped and I didn't report it. After this one, I finally got tired of it and called the sheriff. Small pointed to a four-toed track. See that? Yeah. Wolf track. How can you tell? Four toes. This one is a rear paw track. He failed to mention to Hugh Bailey that there were only two paw prints instead of four. Homer LaCroix stared at Small with wide eyes. You're kidding me, right? Wish I was, Homer. Taught you the one who said everyone in New Orleans was certifiably crazy. They are, but there is a Rougarou running around the bayou. It's been up in St. Tammany Parish as well. 
What are you going to do about it? Nothing. You guys asked me to look into it. I did, and can now report back to you that I found evidence of a wolf-like creature. The agreement was for you to get rid of it. Not for twenty grand. I've had to hire a guide. He's not cheap, by the way. Do they want something more done? LaCroix nodded. Then they're going to have to belly up to the bar and get serious with their offer. What's it gonna take, Shorty? Another thirty for me and twenty for my guide. Fifty thousand? Small nodded. I can't authorize that. I'll have to check with the board. Small stood. You do that and let me know. He walked out of the small cafe, leaving LaCroix to pay the lunch tab. Henry Dumont raised an eyebrow and studied Small. You're offering me $20,000 to help you get rid of this rigaroo? I'm not offering it. The tourism board is. Same thing. He paused and spat a glob of brown liquid to the side. What are you getting paid? Same. Bullshit. The big man shrugged. Never made that much money all at once. Taxes will be hell. Cash, Henry. Oh, that makes a huge difference. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, what's your plan? I need to talk with your cousin first. Two hours later, Small sat at the small conference table in Dr. Carmen Fowler's office. You're telling me you think you found a real lycanthrope? Only explanation I can come up with. Tell me the details. He did. When he finished summarizing his findings, the professor pursed her lips and remained quiet. Finally, she said, My intellectual side tells me there has to be another explanation. However, your evidence suggests only one conclusion. I know. I find it hard to accept myself. What do you need from me? How do I stop the damn thing? She stood and once again went to her bookshelf. Finding the same volume used the last time Small visited, she placed it on the table. With a practiced hand, she opened the book and flipped through several pages. After finding the correct spot, she said, Without going into a lot of detail, Shorty, you need to seek a gypsy's help. With a frown, Small tilted his head. Gypsies? What the hell for? With a calming smile, Dr. Fowler continued. There are still gypsy encampments scattered throughout the bayou here in southern Louisiana. Seek out the largest one and talk to the wise woman of the encampment. They are known as Puridae. They will help you. She paused. For a prize. Figures. How do I find them? My cousin Henry will know where this camp is located. How much? She shrugged. Only the Puridae will be able to tell you. She said that? She did. Damn, gypsies make me nervous, particularly the ones she mentioned. Why? Well, you're not going to tell me you're scared of them, are you? No. He paused for a second and looked at Small. You ever been around them? The big man shook his head. I guessed it nice enough, but... Henry, they're of Romanian descent. Some groups travel around the country going where the work is. Since there is still a lot of construction going on in New Orleans, it makes sense large groups are here. Just because they have different beliefs and traditions doesn't make them scary. Your cousin said they can help us. Do you know where this large camp is? He nodded. Well then, for $20,000 in cash, suck up your concerns and take me there. The camp resembled a small village with framed buildings and a population of 40 souls. Situated on a large island surrounded by swamp, the arrival of Shorty Small and Henry Dumont brought the equivalent of a mayor out to meet them. After introductions, the small-statured woman stared up at Shorty with a tilted head. Where did your ancestors hail from, Mr. Small? I am told Norway on my mother's side. The woman who introduced herself as Adriana Nika nodded. I'm your father. The large man shrugged. Never met him. My mother and I lived with her brother and his family. Let me see your hand. With a slight smile, Shorty offered her his right hand. She examined it for a few minutes and then released it. 
Why did you seek us out? I was told you could help us deter the activities of Arugaru. The woman showed no surprise at the question. She looked up at Small and said, You seek the one who roams our bayou? We do. Come, let us talk out of the sun. The small bungalow Adriana led them to consisted of a living room, kitchen, and bedroom. A breeze flowed through open windows, creating a comfortable interior despite the warm, humid day. They sat on decorative pillows in the center of the larger area. She looked at Small and said, You are a hunter. Of sorts. She gave him a knowing smile. Yes, of sorts. You come to ask my help to rid the swamp of this creature who attacks men and beasts. I was told you know how to kill the Rougarou. She nodded once. Will you tell me? First, let me ask you why you wish to kill it. I've been asked to. Has it wronged you or one of your kin? No, but it killed a friend of a friend. Ah, she closed her eyes for a moment. When they opened, she smiled. Then I will help you. Madame Adriana, how long has the creature roamed this bayou? We have been here for four years, and we have heard it at least once a month since we arrived. Has it ever attacked your camp? Only once. It killed several of our dogs, both of which were Muritic shepherds. Small raised an eyebrow. I'm familiar with the breed. Large and excellent guard dogs. Yes, the beast dispatched them with little effort. Afterwards, we took precautions. Such as? The Rougarou, despite its strength and size, has several weaknesses. Fire and the harsh cry of a crow. We have used crows to protect our village ever since and have not been bothered by the Rougarou again. Can a silver bullet kill it? She chuckled. You are confusing our Cajun version of the beast with a werewolf from Europe. Rumors say it can, but the only definite way to kill the beast is to behead it and burn the body. Afterwards, the ashes must be scattered so it cannot regenerate. With a frown, Small stayed silent for a few moments. That seems a bit extreme. It is an extreme beast. She took a deep breath. Normally, a Rougarou will be cursed for 101 days and then return to normal. However, if the beast consumes human flesh within those 101 days, it is doomed to be a Rougarou for eternity. Killing it would actually release the victim from its curse. Dumont started to ask a question but hesitated, returning to silence. Adriana noticed and asked, You have a question, Mr. Dumont. Yes, ma'am. Do you know where the beast lives? No, we tried to avoid contact with it. She returned her attention to Small. He asked, How much do you require to help us? That would depend on the help you seek. Obviously, you have learned how to keep the beast away, so you probably know how to attract it. Be careful of what you ask for, Mr. Small. Inviting a Rougarou to attack you could result in several outcomes, none of which are in your best interest. Such as? If you are attacked, bitten, and survive, you would carry the curse yourself. If you do not survive, you will be devoured. You must remember, the creature has superhuman strength while in the form of the beast. If I behead the beast, will it die? She nodded. You would also need to burn the body. Immediately. You mentioned that, Madame Adriana. How much will you require to help us? I can make a potion to attract it. The potion will cost you $1,000. When can you have it prepared? When can you have the money? Tomorrow. Make it the day after. The moon will be full. On the journey back to Dumont's dock, the two men remained silent, not discussing the conversation with the gypsy woman. As the Cajun guide eased the airboat into its berth, he shut off the engine and said, I hope you have a plan, Shorty. I do. Hopefully I'm not part of it. If you want your 20000 you are. Damn. 
48 hours later, as the sun disappeared into the western horizon, Small and Dumont finished loading the equipment needed to set their trap. The bait would be a live goat with some of the potion smeared on its back. The small animal would be tethered to a bald cypress tree on a narrow spot of solid ground a mile from the gypsy settlement. Both men wore a sachet bag of angelica root, sage, and laurel dangling from a lanyard around their neck. According to Adriana, the herbs were gathered during the moon's waxing phase, the only time they could be harvested to effectively ward off the Rougarou. The final item needed had been obtained from a Louisiana volunteer firefighter, a flamethrower used to start backfires. The firefighter happened to be a nephew of Henry Dumont. With all the necessary supplies loaded in the airboat, the two intrepid lycanthrope hunters set out as the full moon rose in the east. When they entered the bayou, the Cajun shut down the main engine and let the airboat drift for a while. Dumont, still not 100% in favor of the idea, said, Before I turn on the trolling motor, I'm gonna try to talk you out of this stunt one more time, shorty. Go for it. You sure this is a smart idea? No, but I've never been accused of being smart. What if it doesn't show up? It will. Your confidence is overwhelming. Although Dumont could not see it, Small displayed a grin. Relax, Henry. You've got the easy job, the flamethrower. I've got the job of beheading it. I still don't understand how you're planning to do that. I guess you'll have to watch. That's what makes me nervous. Off in the distance, a lone howl they associated with the creature could be heard. Small pointed toward the interior of the bayou. Let's head that way. With the silent trolling motor pushing the flat bottom boat, Dumont steered it deep into the swamp. They heard the cry two more times, with each sounding closer than the previous incident. The full moon created long and sinister shadows on the monochrome landscape. Small concentrated on the area ahead of them as the boat moved at a steady three miles per hour. A thrashing of water could be heard to their right, and all the night creature noises went silent. The roar of a gator off in the distance was followed immediately by the now familiar cry of the Rougarou. Dumont whispered, Think the gator got him? Small held up his hand. Shh. Swamp sounds returned. A noise to their right caused Small to point his shotgun in its direction. Red glowing eyes stared back at him. The growl of a wounded animal met their ears. This caused the goat they brought for bait to start screeching. Suddenly, the Rougarou charged their position. Small pulled the trigger on the semi-automatic shotgun three times. Knowing the slugs had hit their mark, the creature continued to charge. Small yelled, Change of plans! Get us out of here! With the fan at full speed, Dumont swung the airboat around and Small pushed the goat out as they sped away. Looking behind them, he saw the creature capture the small animal. Not wishing to watch any further, he faced forward. The next day, Dumont sipped coffee as he watched Small sharpen a 29-inch long machete. Even after last night, you're still hell-bent on catching this rougarou, aren't you, shorty? More so now than last night. Why? Small stopped working on the machete and focused on Dumont. Because I now know how to kill it. After taking another sip of his coffee, the Cajun narrowed his eyes. What'd you see last night? An opening. Want to share what you saw? The big man shook his head. I have to do this alone, Henry. While I appreciate your thinking of my safety, he paused. Are you crazy? No. What I have failed to consider is this creature is still a man, and thus he is subject to certain urges. With a roll of his eyes, Dumont folded his arms. What are you going to do, find a female Rougarou for him? With a chuckle, Small returned to sharpening his machete. Not what I had in mind. He failed to get us last night. He's going to be pissed about it, and when I give him another chance, he'll take the bait. Won't he be more aggressive? Looking up from his work, Small smiled. Exactly. I'm counting on it. What do you need me to do? teach me how to drive an airboat. Instead of entering the bayou at night, Small slipped into the swamp around five in the afternoon. Using the quiet electric trolling motor to steer the flat bottom boat, he guided it to a small island he spotted the previous night. Before unloading his equipment, he attached a collar to a goat and hooked it on the end of a steel cable. 
Running the cable along the ground, he wrapped it around the exposed roots of a bald cypress tree and secured it. Taking the remaining potion acquired from Madame Adriana, he rubbed it on the goat's back. With this accomplished and his equipment unloaded, he moved the airboat to the opposite end of the island and tied it to a tupelo tree. When he walked back to the spot where the goat stood, it appeared calm, munching on the undergrowth of the land. For the better part of the next hour, Shorty Small set up his trap. When finished, using rope included with his equipment, he climbed the tree above where the goat lay taking a nap. Then, like he had done for 20 years as a hitman, he settled in, waiting for his mark. Nightfall came and the moon still appeared full. The landscape took on the eerie shadows of the previous evening. Cicada song once again filled the air and birds called and cackled at random intervals. The roar of several gators could be heard off in the distance. Shorty Small's concentration did not waver. Using a particularly strong limb, he stretched out to wait. He could remember many less comfortable vigils. According to his internal clock and the position of the moon, he guessed the time to be approaching midnight when he heard off in the distance the thrashing and splashing of something moving rapidly through the bayou. As the sound grew closer, he tightened his grip on the machete and withdrew it from its leather sheath. Remaining perfectly still, he made no further noise. The sound of the approaching creature vanished for a few minutes. However, Small could tell the goat sensed danger as it started testing the length of its tether and making noise. A sound Small would later describe as coming straight from the blackness of hell broke the relative quiet of the surrounding area. A creature eight feet in height pounced on the terrified goat. Small, having anticipated this moment, stabilized himself on the limb and prepared for his attack. Timing would be key as he positioned himself over the ravaging beast as it tore the goat apart. Then, at the same time he jumped, the beast looked up and howled. Dawn broke in the east as the fire slowly burned itself out. The stench emitted from the early inferno faded as the glow of the embers slowly died. Using a folding tactical shovel, Small gathered what ashes he could and fed them into the slow-moving water beside the island. Only one task needed to be accomplished when the last of the ashes disappeared into the murk of the brackish water. He needed to bury the severed head of the creature. Once a suitable hole was dug, Small walked to where it had landed after his savage swipe with the razor-sharp machete. He had not looked at it since his plunge from the tree limb six hours prior. His concentration centered on using the commercial flamethrower to burn the body as completely as possible. Using a gloved hand, he picked up the severed member and looked at it. No longer did it appear to be a wolf or even a canine. The head was that of a tired old man whose face appeared to finally be at peace. After covering the remains with a deep layer of dirt, Shorty Small returned his equipment to the airboat. Checking to make sure nothing remained of his adventure, he guided the craft away from the small island in the middle of the New Orleans bayou. As the island grew small in his rearview mirror, he noticed a drop of red on the toe of his left boot. With a frown, he raised his left hand and saw a gash just below his palm. Blood slowly seeped from the one-inch wound. I found this old journal tucked away in the back of my attic, in a box full of old newspapers, all about the same story. A wealthy, respected doctor had butchered his wife. He'd been declared mad and locked away in an asylum. All the while, he claimed his wife was already dead when they'd been married. The name of the doctor is written in the front of the journal, so I suppose it's his. A dreary day, both inside and outside. With my lack of patience, I have little to do but write in this old book. Not that much has changed since the last entry, save for that one romance I then briefly entertained is now long over. Charlotte was a beautiful woman, surely, but she did not meet my personal standards for a wife. She was incredibly dull and with poor manners. Mother says my standards are so high I'll never get married at this rate. She would say that, though, my father had settled for her, a grocer's daughter with a harpy screech of a laugh that had no proper breeding. 
In this regard, I'm thankful I was sent to live with my father's brother when I was a child, so I was properly educated. I do want to marry, but my wife must be of good breeding, with pleasant manners, and worthy of my name. I won't accept anything less, and if that means I must remain a bachelor, then a bachelor I will remain. I must end this entry here. I have a party to go to tonight, hosted by my good friend Kirk Archer. Let it end my sour mood in moping over things out of my control. My luck has changed. The sun shines golden through my morning window, signifying this wonderful event. I have met a woman, and she is everything I have wanted. The party was joyful, and at least pulled me out of my brooding enough to socialize with my fellow man. Kirk tapped my shoulder about halfway through the night, and whispered that his wife wanted to introduce me to someone. I have nothing against Abyss. She's a woman worthy of Kirk, even if she's prone to that womanly sin of gossip. She had been introducing me to several of her friends in the past, though, and none had been particularly suited to me, so my expectations were low when Kirk went to go fetch her. The woman that passed through the door behind Avis put out any negative thought in my mind. Words cannot describe her elegant beauty. A galata sprung from mythology and into my life. Skin like white marble, raven hair drawn into a silver comb and eyes, eyes so deep and dark, they make the night sky appear shallow. I barely heard Avis introduce her, only making out a name, Delilah, beautiful, perfect Delilah. I approached her and could barely make my own introduction, my mouth dry as if I'd stuffed it full of straw. Delilah smiled at me, at me. I never felt so important. It's a pleasure to meet you, Dr. Egerton. She spoke so well, not too loudly, but clear as a bell. I feel like a new man today. I spent most of the night talking with Delilah, learning about her, telling her about myself. She was the daughter of a relative of Avis's, and had only come to the city after finishing her schooling. She was in perfect form, spoke of arts, not of politics. Enjoyed a glass of sherry, but not another. And when we parted, I asked if we could see each other again, and she accepted. I want to see her every day of my life. I cannot close my eyes without seeing Delilah in my mind. God has heard my want and has answered my prayers. A woman of proper breeding, with good manners and so indescribably beautiful. I will pursue this relationship like a hound chases a fox without relent. Delilah. Oh, Delilah. I will make you my wife. I have been courting Delilah. Kirk has been more than willing to chaperone us, and it was Delilah who politely insisted on his presence. A proper woman, through and through. We take walks through the park where I tell her about my work and how my week is gone and she listens, never interrupting, only adding amusing conversational points when I invite them. I have learned more about her as well. Sadly, her mother and father passed away in a dreadful accident, but she was lucky to live with an aunt who made sure she was properly raised. Now a grown woman, she has come into her parents' fortune and said she needs to find a good husband so that her family's money isn't squandered. I am in no need of her wealth, and I made mention of this. The light in those beautiful eyes of hers. I believe she is interested in me as well. Alas, I will not be seeing her this week. Kirk sent me a letter telling me that Delilah had fallen ill and would spend the week in bed. I offered to come look her over, but he said it wasn't all that serious. She just needed bed rest. 
I will miss her, but the anticipation will make seeing her again all the better. I have seen Delilah again. She was tired, but well enough to enjoy our walk. She explained her constitution was weak from time to time, but she always got better after some quiet rest. I offered to introduce her to another doctor, as our relationship would make it inappropriate for me to see her medically. She gracefully declined. She'd been to all the doctors whom there was nothing new to be added to her diagnosis. Just rest and quiet, not even seeing Avis and Kirk. At least it appears it's nothing serious. She looks as lovely as ever. It was as charming as ever. I dare get my hopes up. I may have found my Mrs. Egerton. I forgot about this old journal again. Busy few months at work and with Delilah. No time to write my thoughts. But Delilah has taken ill again. And all I can do now is wait to see her again. It started last night during our regular walk. I have gotten so easily comfortable around her that I almost wish to hold her hand, but I do not. I am a gentleman, and Delilah is a lady, and even if Kirk were not present, I would never be so daring. But fate seemed to conspire with me, and we'd taken a path we usually did not. It was not us often traveled. It was more difficult for a woman to walk. As a gentleman, I offered her my hand, which she so gratefully accepted. Her sleeve had shifted in the movement, though, and I noticed it first. A small sore, no bigger than the tip of my thumb, distorting otherwise perfect skin on her wrist. I'd initially thought it was a beetle, or she'd smudged ink there while she'd been writing letters. I went to wipe it away, and I felt the break in her skin, the wetness of blood. Delilah became stiff and jerked her hand away, realizing at once what I'd touched. She frantically apologized, saying she'd cut her wrist while in the garden earlier that day and hadn't realized it had gotten so poorly. I offered her my handkerchief, which she gratefully wrapped around the injury, but she requested I escort her home. I imagine it was because she had been so flustered. When I went to see her this afternoon, I was declined at the door again by Kirk and told about Delilah's poor health. I was disappointed, but instead spent my time with Kirk, catching up about our daily life. This determines me, though. I will ask Delilah to marry me. I cannot imagine life without her, and being unable to comfort her in this time is torture. She is the perfect woman for me. I will not let her get away. Delilah and I are officially engaged. I could not be a happier man. I wish I could meet her mother and father as is proper, but at least she could meet my parents tonight. I was nervous. What man wouldn't be? But my fears were for naught. Delilah is perfect, and everyone who meets her knows this. Even my mother warmed up to her quickly enough after she spent some time alone in the parlor with Delilah. Although she'd been cold up to Delilah till then, after they were acting like old friends, like a mother and a daughter. I'm curious as to what their conversations could have been, but I'll keep such thoughts to myself. All that matters is that I will be a married man in six months. Perhaps it's a bit quick of an engagement, but I cannot make myself wait any longer. I will have the life I've always wanted, with the perfect wife. I've been so busy planning the wedding that I've neglected this, but I need to get my feelings out somewhere. Tomorrow is the day. I couldn't have been more elated. But tonight I was visited by Kirk and my good mood turned bitter with what he told me. First, let me state he was clearly drunk, swaying and reeking of gin. The look in his eyes was one that was haunted, though, as if he'd seen indescribable horror. 
He begged to speak with me, alone. His words so slurred, I could scarcely understand him. Afraid for his safety, I led him into my home. In the parlor, Kirk poured himself another drink. He usually doesn't take such liberties, but clearly whatever was on his mind had him so distressed that proper manners were beyond him. After taking a drink, he faced me. You cannot marry Delilah. Call off the wedding tonight. At this moment, do not delay. I was both so angry and heartbroken at this declaration. I demanded to know why, of course, why I couldn't marry the woman of my dreams. What he said next made me realize that my dearest and lifelong friend had gone completely stark raving mad. He claimed my fiancé had been dead ever since we fell in love. I laughed at such a ridiculous claim. I'd held her hand, felt the warmth of her fingers, pulse on her wrist. Her cheeks flushed red when she was excited. She was not dead, but he insisted. This week she had taken ill again, likely due to all the stress of becoming a bride. Kirk had not intended on becoming a bother, but he needed Avis's input on some task and knew she was taking care of Delilah, so surely he could go in for just a moment. He described a scene of filth, of decaying flesh hanging off of Delilah's limbs, of Avis feeding her as her fingers were oozing too much pus to grip the spoon. It was so awful to hear I nearly became sick. But the story is so ridiculous. In the same breath. I am an expert in modern medicine. One of the best doctors in this city. What he described was just... Impossible. I sent for Avis and consoled my friend to the best of my ability while she came with some other doctors. He begged not to be committed. That he wasn't insane but it is the only answer to what he's saying. I am sorrowful that he will miss the wedding. So was Avis. And she told me Delilah sends her best. Of course, I told Avis the mad story her husband said, and Avis just shook her head. She said Kirk hadn't even come near Delilah's bedroom. So could he have seen what he had described? I only hope that Kirk recovers soon, and we can move past this. Our wedding was perfect. A year to the date of our first wonderful meeting, Delilah in a dress of pure white, crying with joy as we were joined in marriage. I admit, a tear was in my eye as well, but I kept my composure. I wish that Kirk was there. But Avis came in his stead, gifting us a lovely new tablecloth, and once again apologizing for the scene that happened the night before. Thankfully, Delilah was oblivious to it all. My wife sleeps next to me now. Beautiful, heavenly in the lamplight. No signs of the delusion that Kirk told me of. Not that I ever gave it a second thought, of course. What he described was preposterous. Insane. I'll never give it a second thought. Something terrible has happened today. My day was already rather poorly. My dear and heaven-gifted Delilah is ill and is refusing to let me into her bedroom. She demanded I send for Avis, as she doesn't want me to see her in this condition. Nothing I could do could convince her so I simply headed to the hospital to begin my workday. It was chaotic the moment I arrived. A patient had arrived and expired the night previous. Nothing shocking about that. What was shocking was when the family came to retrieve the body, and there was a piece missing. Someone had taken a cut of the corpse's thigh and sliced open the stomach. From what my quick examination revealed was a missing chunk of liver. 
The father demanded to know who had violated his daughter's body, and I had no answer. I'd assume body thieves, but they wouldn't have just taken two pieces of flesh. At the very least, they would have run off with the head or torso. I can only assume this was the actions of a perverse madman, an insane fetishist. The family will receive quite the sum and recompense for what had been done. The mood at the hospital was heavy, and the mood in my home is no better. I don't know what's worse, having to deal with Avis while she's chatting away at me while cooking at the stove, or when she's with Delilah and I am alone in a home that should not feel so empty as it does. I had a nightmare. One so awful I'd think it real if I didn't know it was impossible. Even now, my fingers tremble as I write on these journal pages. The images burned into my mind like a brand. I wish to forget them, but all I can do is put them in this book. It was night. I could not bear to be apart from my sweet Delilah any further. I got up in the night and headed for her room, just to kiss goodnight. A check to see how poorly she was. I am a doctor, an expert in my field. Surely I should be able to take care of my beautiful wife. I knew something was wrong the moment I opened the door. The scent of flowers and perfume only partially masked the bittersweet rot that hung heavy on the air. I was nearly overcome by it, but I pressed deeper into the room, afraid my dear had a wound that had putrefied. She laid on the bed, still as a corpse, as that was what she'd become. My lovely Delilah was sprawled across the bed, her face still beautiful and pale, but from the neck down. Oh, it was terrible. Just terrible. Bloated, rotting, with maggots crawling out of pus-filled pustules and flies buzzing about her body. I was overcome with disgust and grief when she opened her death-glazed eyes and flicked her gaze towards me. That is the last thing I remember. I woke up this morning in cold sweats and an aching head. I'd somehow rolled out of bed and hit myself in the back of the skull. It still hurts, but for once Avis is being helpful. She isn't even talking too much as she brings me tea. I did go to Delilah's door, and although my nose tried to trick me into thinking there was rot, Delilah called out to me and reassured me of her health. She was already starting to feel better. In days, she'd be back in my arms. I told her I loved her again and again, how beautiful I thought she was. None of which I explained as to why. No, oh, my poor aching head. I'm going to lie down. Rest and relaxation for me too as well as my darling Delilah. Once again, Delilah is in my homes. As healthy and whole as I last remember her. My dream came and haunted me again and again, more twisted and macabre each time I closed my eyes. A half-dead Delilah coming to me in the night. Flesh slowing off her body with each step, her lips curled in a repugnant grin. Nothing like my real Delilah. I finally told her of my dreams, and she was wonderful, of course. Soothing me about such mad nightmares, reassuring me that she was just fine. More than fine. She loves me so much, and I love her. Now that we are reunited... My mind should not be so cruel to me. At least, I hope. What a wonderful day. Delilah is with child. Perhaps that is why she took ill at the beginning of this month, but it does not matter. I could not be happier. She will soon have my child. I beg for a son to carry my family's name, but... Even a girl will be welcome. She will no doubt be as beautiful and charming as her mother. Delilah is also filled with delight.
She is already making lists of names, decorating the nursery. Oh, has my house been blessed? I hope this will be the first of many children. I want a house filled with laughter and little ones. A nanny will have to be hired, especially with Delilah's health troubling her from time to time. I will hire the best one I can. Our family will be perfect. I am afraid Kirk's delusional state has come to bother me once again, as well as Kirk himself. He is home from the hospital, now reduced to a pitiful state. Hair falling out, unable to lift himself from his chair, this empty look in his eyes. The man I once considered a friend seems to be dead, replaced by a breathing corpse. I did go to see him. Avis was reluctant to let me in, but she relented after I said I'd only stay for a short time. His gaze remained blank while Avis cleaned uh, about the room. And I told him all the things he'd missed, how things were going at the hospital, how we were expecting our first child. He did nothing except stare until Avis left the room. Then he snapped back to life, bony hands gripping the arms of his chair. Do yourself a favor, old friend. Kill that woman before that malignant baby even draws breath, he snarled. The anger, the true rage with which he said that. For the first time, I was actually, truly afraid of Kirk. I composed myself, as a gentleman does, and told him I would do nothing of the sort. What he experienced was madness, as my wife was healthy as she could be, save for the days she took to seclusion for her illness. Kirk glared at me for several silent seconds, the hair on my neck standing straight, as I feared he would lurch up and attack me. Finally, he just sighed and flopped back in his chair, as if feeling the anger alone was an exhausting endeavor. If you need proof, wait for Delilah to take ill again. Go into her room. Do not accept her excuses or pleading to stay out. You will see. You will see, and you will understand. Before I could question him further, Avis came into the room and insisted I leave so that her husband could rest. Nagging woman. Perhaps that's what drove him to madness, having such a demanding, frightful wife, and such madness has him lashing out at my perfect Delilah. But these thoughts now won't leave my head. I can't stop thinking about it. If for even a moment I lose focus, my mind goes to my wife's regular seclusion. I fear I may go mad myself at this rate. And as if fates conspired, my wife is taken to her room again due to her illness. Avis is nothing her back to health. But tonight I will go. I will finally put to rest these thoughts of a madman that have infected me with doubt of my beloved Delilah. I finally found my perfect wife. I won't lose her. I have been tricked. All this time, I believed Delilah. I lost faith in my dearest friend because of her. I had wool pulled over my eyes, and now I pay for it. I did go to Delilah's room after dark. At most... I expected to see her asleep, as peaceful as could be, a hand draped over her slowly growing belly. I would hate myself for doubting her. I would kiss her on the head and go back to my own room, pray that she would forgive me. Instead, I entered the room to see I was peeling a strip of putrid flesh off of Delilah's bare back. The wet tear barely registered in my mind because all I could do was process the smell. The bittersweet decay, cloying 
overwhelming every other sense and making the room tilt as I could scarcely draw breath. Both Avis and Delilah turned towards me. Delilah's face, white as snow, still perfect and whole compared to the sickly sight the rest of her had become. She had yet to strip the skin from her belly, but the rest of it was slow and free, muscle overcome by tumors leaking pus and blackened blood. She looked like a dead woman. I didn't know that Avis could move that fast, or hit so hard. I believe she'd taken a candlestick to bash me over the head, but I didn't see for sure. I was too focused on this macabre being my wife had become. By the time I saw her coming for me, I couldn't defend myself from her heavy blows. I came in and out of consciousness as I was dragged back to my room, and as I laid on the floor, in shock from both the sight I'd been subjected to and being hit over the head, I heard Avis barricading my bedroom door. By the time I came back to myself, I'd been trapped in my room. I cannot make the door budge. From what I hear downstairs, Avis is telling any callers that I have become ill and cannot be disturbed. I tried to pound on the floor, alert them that I was trapped, but my house swallowed any sounds of distress. All I have is my journal, and my thoughts. The facade so carefully set before me, destroyed. My marriage has been a lie. I have married a dead woman. Avis is a cunning thing, and far stronger than I'd ever assumed the fluttery woman. I've now had chains attached to my legs. I can go about my room, but I am truly a prisoner. I am brought food. I am given the daily newspaper, but I cannot go for help. Even if I could get the door open, after Ivis beat me unconscious again, she'd had a proper lock put on the door. Delilah came to visit me after the chains were put into place. Her shame couldn't have been more evident now that the truth was out there between us. That, and she hadn't healed yet. Not totally. Pink, new skin starting to form. We're outnumbered by the oozing sores. She resembled a victim of the plague, except for her face. Her perfect, beautiful face was untouched by this curse. She told me a story about what she was. Many generations ago, a man fell in love with a woman both alive and dead. In a state of decay and life, all at the same time. The children they had were beautiful, but when the girls became women, every few months they would undergo the shedding. They'd rot like a corpse, and then they'd come back to life, as beautiful as ever. Avis was not of the bloodline. It came from Delilah's father, which is what she thinks is odd. As far as she was aware, this woman that shed could not have children, yet she was pregnant. Even in her own family, she was an anomaly. But she assured me that she loved me, and that she was so happy to be my wife, that she was sorry she kept this secret. But how could she tell me? How could she tell me indeed? I turned away from her. I am still a gentleman, and what I wanted to tell her, what I wanted to scream at her, were things a gentleman did not say. So she left, weeping. What else did she expect? I cannot trust her again. I loved her. I loved her more than life itself, and now all I see is a bloated corpse, a vile abomination against God and man. Only a love so strong could turn into a hate so poisonous now inside me. I will kill Delilah if I am freed from these chains. Of this, I have no doubt. But will she remain dead? Would it even be murder if she'd been dead all along? 
these walls close in on me a little more each day. I wish to bite and claw my way through them, dig like a hound going for a badger, find the badger, tear her throat out with my teeth, kiss her goodnight, tell her how much I loved her. Ever says I'm being dramatic. When I cry out in the night, she comes into the room and gags me so I will be silent. She doesn't understand. She doesn't care. I hate her. She hates me. I spit in her face when she brings me dinner, and she compares me to Kirk, weak of mind and spirit. A pathetic man who just wanted a pretty wife that performed her role to the letter as he wrote it. I cannot stand being in here. I want to be free. I want to go out. I want to scream in the streets of the night that I had been a widower even before we exchanged the vows. I want to crawl through the cracks in the floor, find myself on the wedding day, and when they ask for objections, I will stand in the back and scream them. I would scream that she is dead. She cannot be married to a gentleman. Kirk... My good friend, I am so sorry I thought you were mad. Because truth, it turns out, is madder than anything the mind could ever twist together. I heard Delilah scream. I scream back. The sounds of agony can only be one thing. I am to be a father. Forgive the smears of blood on this page. I feel at peace. My life is over, no doubt. I will be locked in a prison or madhouse for what I have done. For what I have seen. But I have done what I can to make this travesty right. Delilah was moaning and screaming through the night cacophony of sound causing me to rip my hair out as all I could do was sit there and listen. Then Avis barged into the room. Without a word, she undid my chains and dragged me from my room. I remember her telling me that there was a problem, that Delilah could push no longer and my medical expertise would be needed. If I had the strength, I would have asked... Why not call for the midwife? But once we were in the bedroom, it became clear that Delilah's secret would be no more if there had been another person called in. Delilah had pushed so hard she'd torn, and she rotted like the worm-infested apple she secretly was. She was sobbing, saying the shedding had never hurt before, but now her baby... Our baby was trapped. She was physically unable to push now. The muscles were just not working. I asked for a knife and it was given. I was still a doctor, and I cut my wife's belly open. I pushed aside putrefying organs and tumor-infested flesh to get to her womb. Blood poured onto the bed like water, but I did not focus on that. I dug my fingers through her rotten flesh, rending her open with little care. She was already dead. She was already dead. It didn't matter. I almost expected to find a stillbirth inside of her. After all, she said women of her bloodline didn't give birth. But in all this vile putrefaction, once the final cut was made... There it was, a perfectly healthy baby, pulled into the light, already beautiful, perfect, just like Delilah. It's a girl! Avis took the baby from me, and it howled, its pitiful little lungs filling with air as it was wiped clean. A girl... A carrier of that horrible bloodline. A terrible little girl. 
Travis made the mistake not taking the knife from me as soon as the daughter was born. I plunged it into Delilah's chest. Delilah's eyes went wide, and she made a quiet sound, and that was all. She no longer had it in her to scream. I was the one screaming. I screamed how I hated her, how I loved her, how she'd become my world and then took it away all the while. The knife acted on its own in my hand, stabbing into her again and again. I wanted to cut it all out. All the rot, all the filth, just cut it out of her. By the time the knife slid out of my hand so slicked with blood I could no longer hold it, Delilah was gone. Not dead. She'd always been dead. But gone. There was little left but splattered viscera and broken bones. Her terribleness is strewn across the room. Only her face is left whole. Eyes closed in peaceful surrender. I did pick up the knife and turn to where I'd last noticed Avis, but she was gone. So, so is Delilah's daughter. It was then my mind finally translated the final weak sound Delilah had made before she'd left. Take her. Run. Avis had once again barricaded the door, but I would not attempt to escape my fate anyway. I hear the man of the law down the hall now. They will be coming in here shortly enough. I hope they don't slip on the blood. As my final words before I am taken, I am not guilty of anything. My wife was already dead. It didn't seem to start off as an end-of-the-world scenario, though I reckon I wouldn't truly have known what an end-of-the-world scenario looked like necessarily. I suspect balls of gelatin raining down from the sky would not have given me the first inkling of a clue. Unfortunately though, as I sit here, huddled alone in this movie theater in the darkness, the stale smell of body odor and popcorn, sticky spots on the floor that I try and convince myself is spilled soda pop, and the sound of my heart loud in my throat. I realize I should have possibly thought balls of gelatin were a possibly potential beginning of the end. I was off my meds and on some good substitutes if that counts. What the fuck do I know? I'm not even in the movie theater. Not really. But would you believe me if I said I was in a living vat of extraterrestrial jizz or safely in my own bed? I had just dropped three hits of window pane that I found wrapped in foil and buried under a layer of freezer permafrost, wedged between a quarter bottle of vodka and three Brussels sprouts that had escaped the confinement of the bag only to suffer a frozen fade among the relics of the past. These hits were supposedly part of the same batch that Hendrix had in his headband as he lit the guitar on fire and established his supremacy years before a cocky kid from Oak Cliff took that same crown as the greatest living guitarist. I told myself I saved them for a special event, yet special events seemed to keep happening while they were covered in gross ice. Now this was a type of super acid. All the good ones had a name, so you felt like you were doing something epic. I didn't expect that the end of the world would be the reason for the trip, but that is exactly where I found myself the night of the storm. I didn't even realize the storm was really real, you know. Like, it was storming, but the details got fuzzy in translation from my eyes to my brain. The lightning was lavender across the soft black of the sky. I had visions of a fungus from a strange documentary I previously watched, Ask a Makoda a long cluster of cells that share every sensation in a long strand of molten purple in the fur of a regal panther. The moon peeked out and the oddness of the storm lent a sickly emerald to the pockmarked face and unflinching orb of the great beast curled around the blue marble. Did the purple hurt the giant cat? 
Would it bear its claws and strike me down? I didn't care. I'd been chasing the same high for the last twenty years, and all it seemed to do was make everything else fuzzy. I had hair on my brain as thick as the fur on the Sky Panther, but this felt close, or at least close enough for now. I heard stories about a technique where they drill a hole in your head just right that it induces a permanent trip. I'd like that, or would have. Now I'm not sure. Reality got all sort of flip-flopped and everything feels all fuckered up. There were hints that things were not normal. Even through the new veneer of old drugs, things were off. The rain, for one thing, was hot, and as it began to beat down on the dry ground of the backyard, the temperature seemed to rise. I was sweating on the porch as the old Bowie album wavered on the turntable, and I had the strangest idea that it was raining blood. It was not red, no, more a light blue like aquarium gravel and hot when I reached my hand out from under the porch. The drops felt sticky on my hand, stretching as I pulled my fingers apart. Then it began to hail. I jerked back as the precipitation thudded off the roof of the mobile home that hadn't been mobile for the last 50 years, more or less, rendering it more inert than anything, I guess. There was an odd note to the hail hitting the metal roof. Not the typical clang of balls of ice, but softer sounding. A tennis ball with a dent in it, maybe. I watched in amazement as the knot hail hit the ground in front of me. There was no super ball rebound, but a noticeable bounce that spoke to it, seeming floppier than your typical lice. Is that a word? Floppier? Does it make sense? Hell is frozen. These were almost like cubes of meat, but not. Balls. Balls of gelatin. Not gelatin. I don't know what the fuck it is. Scientists will figure it out one day. Or they won't, and the thing will take over the entire planet. It could. This feels disjointed. I need a joint. Or some orange juice. Maybe just a cigarette. But bear with me, I'm tripping balls and there's a fucking alien something consuming the town. It's raining, I'm on the porch, Bowie is playing, the window pane is coming on strong as I sip lemon and honey. My fingers are stained yellow from chain-smoking cigarettes and joints. The storm rolls in. Balls of fucking gelatin fall like hell off the roof of my not as mobile as it once was home. I watch them splat and rebound into the air. The rain is like blue splooge. I don't know how much of this is real. Right. I had to touch one of the balls. I don't know why, but I felt the need take root in my brain and my body acted. I was on the porch steps before I knew I had started moving. The balls quivered once they finally grew nearly stationary and there was a magic in that pulsing of light purple swirling that called gently. It was as if I could hear them begging me to pick them up. Have you ever heard screaming and not realize that it's screaming inside your brain? I did. Stopped me dead in my tracks at the edge of the steps. Locked my legs solid as steel as the need to touch the quivering balls of blue space come littering the unkempt, mostly dirt yard behind my seriously immobile home. The storm stopped. I couldn't tell you if it was moments or hours ago, but the rhythmic slapping ended leaving the purple flashes in the sky and baleful green glare of the moon and thousands of globs made out of the most enticing substance in the universe. I glared at my cloven hooves grown stationary on the warped boards of the haphazardly constructed temporary steps that became quite permanent in their transience. <clears throat> A black cat came nervously into the yard, spine arched and tail fully fluffed, drawn towards one of the beautiful siren balls. I felt like I had been on the verge of orgasm for hours and my partner decided to take a nap as I watched the cat raise a paw. My breath caught in my throat and my entire body tingled. The first swipe rebounded off the surface and both the cat and I looked oddly disappointed. The second time the paw hit the balls, the ball didn't let go. The cat shook its paw, curiously at first, but the squishy hailstone didn't budge. Curiosity turned to concern and then panic. 
which turned out to be a poor response in a yard of gelatinous little blobs that soon attached themselves to the cat's body. I watched as they pulsated faster, flashes of lavender through translucent blue. They stretched to one another and oozed together until all that remained was a shivering mass enveloping the now motionless cat standing upright. I leaned forward, hips still locked in place by the lizard part of my brain. The cat stared in fright as it slowly melted inside the cocoon of space splooge. The lavender flashed as fur and then skin melted away, layer by layer, exposing the muscle, then bone. Veins and organs appeared and then vanished as the cat seemed to almost fold in upon itself until all that remained was a large, larger than it had been moments before, blob jiggling on the dirt. The call to touch it was broken as the horror of the cat vanishing was replaced by the singular knowledge I was tripping harder than I had since I got dosed at a talking head show. My body relaxed, muscles burning from lactic acid, and I sat back down to watch the light show. It looked like the cosmos and lavender as it ran through the now four-foot tumor. The small bits seemed to shake more and mercurially slink toward the greater good. I got up and turned over the album and grabbed a bottle of orange juice and my trusty bong and went back to watch the show. The call of the balls of goop must have grown as they sought to join together, because squirrels and raccoons scurried into the yard and stood in a ring around the mass. I took a long hit and let out a rattling cough that should have at least startled the animals, but they didn't even flinch. Every time I blinked, the lavender spots seemed to stay within my eyelids, and between that and Bowie singing in the throes of milk and cocaine and peppers, I found myself on a new level of reality. The first squirrel touched the blob, causing me to jerk back at the sudden speed it seemed in which the squirrel went from there to inside to melted. One by one, the woodland critters were engulfed and consumed. The lone balls of gelatin began shaking fiercely, then seemed to pull into the central mass which had become easily seven or eight feet in size at this point. The lilac flares grew bright enough that I saw lights in the neighboring trailer switch on and faces peek out at the commotion. I hit the bong again and let out another body convulsing cough. I didn't care for how the blob reacted to my hacking. The purple concentrated on the side of the lump closest to me. The calling got louder again, but the knowledge none of this was really happening kept me seated. But I didn't like the way it was concentrating on me. I also didn't remember window pane being this intense in the early 70s. I didn't know it was the end of the world either. So as I watched raccoons and squirrels melt to nothing inside an ever-expanding blob that was now nearly 15 feet wide with wobbling balls of gelatin slowly oozing their way to join the main mass staring eyelessly at me, it was with a smile of eager anticipation. This was unfortunately where the trip began to go very bad. What the fuck is that thing, Gary? Pat called to me from the fence line. I smiled even wider. You can see it too, Pat. I'll be damned. It just ate up some squirrels and a couple of raccoons. Hell if I know what it is. Pat slowly nodded. He did everything slowly. Folks said it was out of taking time to consider all possibilities before answering. I call bullshit on that. On no fewer than three occasions, that dumb son of a bitch attempted to eat the same wax apple from the dish on the coffee table three times that I knew of, but every now and then I see fresh indentations in the dusty wax and I know it's him. You come down from the storm? It sounded to my peculiar on the roof. Didn't expect it to be so big. Nor pretty, he said, staring at the clusters of purple light in the milky goop. Yep, balls of this space jizz came flopping down from the sky. Snot, too. It was weird as shit. I was curious if Pat would melt. I never had anything against him, not even that he's as dumb as a sack of rocks, but it sure was neat watching that cat disappear. I tapped out a cigarette and lit it. My fingers shook a little from the excitement. You hear it calling you? Like whispering for you to touch it? It did that to me. Pat didn't answer me. 
He just stood staring at the blob, which was erupting in all new patterns of purple blossoms. He slowly moved towards the gap in the fence and squeezed through. It wasn't so difficult five years ago when he first moved into the park, but middle age settles on everyone eventually, and as his gut got caught on the corner of the fence, I imagined he would make quite the feast for the ewes. Not that I wanted that to happen. I would never wish anything bad to happen to Pat, or anyone. Maybe that bastard Miller at the end of the park, throwing cookouts and overcooking the meat, serving dry steaks and hamburgers while telling the lamest job jokes. Would Miller taste worse than Pat? Probably less flavor, though I doubt anything that eats cats and squirrels and raccoons would be picky. I watched Pat walk towards the blob and felt a new sensation, almost sexual in nature, wavering off the goo. It was excited at the idea of eating Pat. And the dumb bastard had an expression that said he was just as excited. Hey, Pat, why don't you come over here and have a toot off the old bong, and we can watch the blob together. He nodded dreamily, but didn't veer from his heading. Pat? Damn it, man, listen to me. Don't approach it. His prodigious belly hit the blob first, and they seemed to shake together, symbiotically sending waves to wiggle through different types of gelatin. Pat smiled placidly as the purple light swarmed to where his belly pressed against the gelatinous mass. He seemed to look through the blob at me directly, through the distortion of sentient ejaculate and I watched as his expression changed from bliss to sudden painful awareness. Have you ever been to one of them baby doctors? The ones that help the ladies give birth, not necessarily actually the baby doctor. Before the divorce, there were a series of miscarriages. Wasn't either of our faults. Some people just don't have families. It was for the best. Not then. Fuck no. But time proved that some things don't withstand the passing. Prenatal, that's the doctor. Prenatal. Anyways, they have this anatomical figure with a clear belly and you can see the baby in different stages of development. Looking through the wobbly ooze, Pat looked much the same. Except instead of seeing the baby, I saw his guts pressed against the goo as his eyes went from sleepy to horrified. He pushed away from the blob, his hands melted down to exposed bone and rubbery tendon snapping back. The seal broken between him and the blob had his guts just suddenly spilling out onto the wet dirt. Not even spilled, tumbled like pasta out of a colander, while his screams, hoarse, wet, and thick, got lost in Bowie. The blob slid slowly forward, engulfing his lower legs and the various fluids pulling in the mud around them. Fuck was all I could manage, with the modest hope the creature could manage to absorb or whatever the rest of Pat. I didn't relish the thought of whatever I was seeing as my neighbor in 16 or so hours after the drugs wore off. Well, it did think whatever god jizzed through the cosmos to land on my trailer, slowly consume all of Pat in wet, squelching jiggles. It was like a Zamboni slowly clearing the surface of the ice. But then the lavender concentrated on the side closest to me. I was quite sure I was lying on my thin mattress under the black lights, falling deeper and deeper into my own rabid subconscious. It was the only explanation for a shimmering 20-foot blob that just ate my neighbor. I decided to take a stroll through the park and started laughing insanely as I realized I wanted to take my new pet for a walk to mark its new territory. As I stepped down the rickety boards, the temporary permanent steps to my immobile home, the blob did something strange and new. It bristled slightly, and then spikes erupted from the edges of the creature. Five-foot goo spikes that quivered along with the purple pulses. They seemed to sniff at the air, and like the lavender firing inside of it, were too interested in me. Hey, I'm not fucking food. You understand me? I said sternly to the blob, shaking my finger at it. The spikes undulated slightly, and they seemed to suddenly find the trees interesting. Good. You're not ruining my trip by being a greedy asshole. I'm gonna call you Blobbert. Can you understand me, Blobbert? I asked it. 
I have no fucking clue if it did or not. It just sort of roiled in place, space jizz shaped like an angry hedgehog. The way the blue caught the little arcs of lilac reminded me of this girl I used to date back in New York. She had hair that looked a lot like those spikes, and a tattoo of faded cherries right above her own faded cherry. <laughs> I'd pretend I was Pac-Man chasing that cherry as my tongue darted in and out of her, tracing shapes around and across her clit. She had dyed her pubes the same bluish purple. No clue what her name was now. I just think of her as Ms. Pac-Man in those feverish times at night when I can't sleep and pull at my cock angrily hoping to release enough happy chemicals to sleep for a few hours. Come on, Blobbert. Let's meet the neighbors. I called out to it and began to walk around the trailer towards the cracked pavement that wound through the clusters of rusted trailers in 70 shades of avocado and browns. I heard Blobbert sort of slithering across the ground towards me. I lit the joint I had nearly forgotten about in my pants pocket and smiled up to that gleaming panther that made up the evening sky. Hey, Ursa. You check out the storm earlier? The squeaky voice of Jimmy shouted. I looked over and saw him sitting in his front yard, bare feet in a kiddie pool that was shaped like a turtle. I didn't need light to know the ground around him was littered with empty tall boys. Hey, Jimmy. I did from the deck. That was pretty crazy. Jimmy smiled and the streetlight caught his eyes and they seemed to shine like a cat in the dark. Sounded like the worst of it hit your place. Was it hell? Balls of gelatin, I think. Some kind of celestial spunk that sprayed down from heaven. Maybe. Fucked if I know. I heard Blobbert steadily drawing closer and made my way towards Jimmy. I'm tripping my balls off so I'm not really sure about anything, know what I mean? Jimmy nodded. Been there, Ursa. Too many times to count. You got any more acid? Well, it was my time to smile. As a matter of fact, I might have something even better. Jimmy's eyes grew wide for a second, and then his face went slack. What is that thing, Ursa? He asked softly. I looked over my shoulder and saw Blobbert oozing down the road. Well, that's Blobbert. I think he's sentient semen. He ate Pat and some critters a little bit ago. Cool. I I'm going to touch it. I, I need to touch it. I shrugged my shoulders and looked through the cans for an unopened one. I'm going to steal a beer while you do that. Cool. I sat down in one of the plastic banded lawn chairs that was mostly just an iron bar across my ass in the faded shades of yesterday's summer. There was a layer of slime shimmering on top of the turtle's wet spot. Blobbert might eat you, Jimmy. Just a heads up. That sounds pretty all right to me. It sure is pretty. Jimmy just sort of slipwalked down the road to where Blobbert slowly slid. Blobbert seemed slightly larger, but maybe that was the spikes. It was that lady with the cherry tattoo that dosed me before the talking head show. I don't know why I'm more fixated on remembering her name than on Jimmy, who was meandering to an ignoble fate. My brain must be chewing on something big. Hey, Jimmy, you remember Yvonne? Jimmy slowed a little. The cute little redhead, yeah, I remember her. Yep, that's her. I had an awfully big crush on her. I ever tell you that? Jimmy stumbled a little but kept moving. I don't think you ever did. That bitch was crazy. You dodged a bullet there. I nodded and took a long pull off the beer. I remembered seeing her one morning as I left for work. She was leaving Jimmy's trailer and had the makings of a nasty shiner already forming. It never quite settled right, that black eye. But in my hurt, I blew it off as them both getting what they deserved. But they didn't. She got hit, and he got away with it. Until now. Fuck you, Jimmy, I said as I lit a cigarette. Blobber didn't want to wait this time. It lashed out quickly with four spikes that lanced through Jimmy's forearms and thighs. Jimmy screamed in pain as it lifted him into the air. A splattering of liquid hitting the ground made me flinch until I realized it was from Jimmy pissing himself, not something disgusting. That was when Blobbert began to pulsate faster and faster. 
I leaned forward, the iron rod painfully jamming my tailbone to get a better look at the lights. They seemed agitated. Don't play with your food, Blobber, I said as Jimmy gasped loudly, ready in more screams. The four spikes snapped in different directions and so did large pieces of that sack of shit Jimmy. I don't even know exactly what everything was that fell along with the oblong shaped chunk of torso and head that used to be my abusive neighbor. I threw up bile and orange juice into the jizz riddled water in the turtle's concave shell. Blobber just oozed forward, the slowest and most inefficient street sweeper ever, to dissolve the remnants of Jimmy. That's when I noticed all the lights that had come to life in the park. This was about to get exciting. I began rooting around for another beer in the grass. My father saw things. Not intergalactic jizz monsters that ate assholes and morons. At least I don't think he did. He never talked about it, but when he had enough to drink, usually six or seven nights a week only, he would begin yelling at them. He would have been disappointed at how close the apple stayed to the rotten trunk, but I had blobbered, so fuck him and anyone else. Somewhere off in the distance, I heard sirens. I wondered which of these criminals called the cops. I saw Eleanor peek her head around the curtains. Not her. She made meth in her shed out back. The smell would damn near choke the life out of you some days. I looked around the trailer sitting at off angles and began to think of that rider guy and his non-Euclidean geometries. All I could think was how fucked up my subconscious must really be. And still the sirens grew closer. Sounds like you're about to get your food by delivery, Blobbert. Eat a cop for me. I called out and drained the second beer. Ursa, what's that thing? Kara called out. I turned towards her trailer. She peered out the screen door, squat and mannish looking with one of her howling broods stuck to her large flat breast. Miss Kara, let me introduce you to Blobbert, the sentient nutsock of the gods. Blobbert, this is Kara, day shift stripper at the Bone Zone. Day shift manager at the Bone Zone, Kara corrected. Tired of getting your titties slapped? I asked casually as the red and blue began to shine at the entrance to the park. I am making more money with my shorts on for the first time I can remember. She stated proudly. Would have thought they'd have seen that three kids ago, I muttered. She stared at Blobbert for a minute. I hoped she wouldn't take the bait and wander out. Not with her kid, at least. I had to draw the line, even in a drug-induced hellscape of my own creation. Is his name really Blobbert? That just confused me. Yeah, Blobbert the Blob. Why? I don't know, sounds like a male name. Is it a male? I scrunched up my face and tried not to curse in front of her child suckling at that leathery deflated clown balloon. I failed. God damn it, Kara! How in the fuck would I know if it's a male or not? The entire thing is made of some sort of fucking man-eating gelatin. It doesn't have a fucking dick flopping behind it. Use your fucking head. It's a clever name. It's a blob. Blobber. Don't you dare raise your voice at me, Ursa, you ill-mannered bastard, using profanity in front of my fucking child. She yelled and then slammed her front door. Blobbert bristled and began to move towards her trailer. I clapped my hands and the purple lights focused on me. We don't eat children or dogs. We're civilized creatures. The lights guiltily swarmed to the back left corner for a second, and I saw a studded collar exit the blob. You did not eat Mr. Winkles. Mr. Winkles was the most badass chihuahua ever. He had been found injured as a pup and nursed back to health. He had a long scar on his little throat from where something had tried to eat him, which left him unable to bark. He just sort of chuffed softly and then attacked your ankles. Now he was gone. Don't feel bad, Blobber. We hadn't gotten into the rules yet. No more dogs. No kids. The light swarmed for a moment and then focused on the cherries on the cop car speeding through the park. Don't do anything until I get back. Gotta piss. And Jimmy ain't using his commode anymore. I announced and then got up painfully. Jimmy's trailer looked like that cartoon whatever the fuck it was, brown and snarling, spinning through walls and whatnot. 
came here to let off some steam. I wish that coyote had gotten that smug son of a bitch roadrunner, and fuck act me for their overcomplicated machinery. It was half shoddy craftsmanship and half bad luck for that poor bastard. But you gotta ask yourself, with all he had spent on gadgets and paint for the seemingly endless number of tunnels he painted on reddish stone, couldn't he have just ordered a roadrunner already slaughtered and prepared like 10,000 times over? One less order to the quacks at Acme and spent on a professional hitman to quickly and concisely take care of that meeping cocksucker, and the problem is solved. The fuck was I talking about? Jimmy's trailer. I do not understand how that kiddie pool in the shape of a turtle, trailer looking like a roach motel, all around repugnant soul managed to have a revolving cast of decent ladies debasing themselves. The place was gross. Trash everywhere, overflowing ashtrays, roaches seemed to have built a small fiefdom in the kitchen sink, but the fridge was full of beautiful tall boys, so I forgave him a little. He was quartered, after all. I just pissed right there. I'm not proud of my actions, but I really didn't give a shit. I sort of thought I was pissing myself in bed, which is worse in its own way, so I was able to just let loose a stream onto the empty boxes of condoms on the floor. Magnum condoms. Good for you, Jimmy. I heard the tires screech as the cops must have seen Blobbert and grabbed two tall boys and went out to watch the show. To my surprise, Eleanor was standing next to the cops, twitching and scratching at her arms sticking out of a ragged old bathrobe. Her hair was seaweed flowing in the breeze like a trailer park Venus de Milo with burnt lips trying to act like she was a concerned citizen. Hi, Elle. Evening, officers. What seems to be the problem? I asked nonchalantly as I popped the top of the first beer. Hey, Ursa, your dick's hanging out. Eleanor said distractedly. Sir, could you uh, put your penis away, please? A heavy set Hispanic officer said, a dreamy air to his voice. I looked down and saw my junk just hanging and was pretty grateful it was all just a hallucination. It is a mite chilly tonight. My apologies, I muttered as I set down my beer and took my boys back inside. Sir, it is 92 degrees outside, the other officer said, clearly a rookie with a high and tight fade and pressed pants. Now, officer, I don't take too kindly to your implications, I began a bit heatedly. It is probably a good dick, likely a grower. Not all of them are showers, and not all showers are good ones. Eleanor said kindly. Blobbert appeared to be confused and agitated at the flashing red and blue lights. It seemed to swell up. The thick mucus roiled in the nearly frothy slick of cerulean alien discharge, and a spike launched forward through the center of the rookie's forehead and shattered the cherries on the police cruiser. Cherry! Her goddamn name was Cherry! L like the tattoo! How in the fuck did that escape me for this long? That crazy asshole poured half a vial of acid into my amaretto sour, and I didn't realize it until David Burns started singing and the waves ran across my sweaty body like a lover's tongue. I bet that's what Blobbert feels like right before you realize you're being consumed. What the fuck? The other cop, feels unnecessary to say Hispanic since he is the sole survivor, shouted, he pulled his gun, and the world felt an odd precipice of horror and surreal. Eleanor was apparently well equipped for the end of the world, and the chaos didn't seem to faze her at all. She straight up pulled out a pipe and torch and took a big hit of her bathtub meth. I found myself gleefully walking towards her as the cop pointed his gun at Blobber while staring at the rookie. The spike, more like a tentacle I guess really, snapped back with a wet gurgle. The rookie stood for a moment, and as I passed behind him, I smiled at Blobbert and raised a thumb for it to see through the gaping hole where most of his head had been. Something fell with a wet flop from the top of his skull to where his tongue flopped like a bluegill on the shore of his ruined mouth. Blobbert flashed a happy lavender at me, which was nice in a holy fucking hell sort of way. That your pet? Eleanor asked as she handed me the pipe. The blue flame hit and the crystal bubbled on the side of the glass like diarrhea against a truck stop toilet bowl. 
I watched the smoke coalesce like in a palm reader shop crystal ball and saw my future in the rolling smoke. I was going to be fucked up. The smoke hit like inhaling truck exhaust and I felt all the liquid in my mouth turn into electricity as my pupil snapped with an audible click three sizes smaller, or roughly normal sized in conflict with the acid. No, I think he's my ego. Or ID. I don't know. I only took psychology to get laid. <laughs> I said as the smoke tore free from my lungs. Did it work? <laughs> Did what work? I asked confused. Her hair was floating like one of those plasma balls that the voltage follows your fingers. I wanted to touch it, but even in my state of inebriation, I thought better of it. Did you get laid? From the class? She was still staring at Blobber, and I could tell she wanted to go to it. Yeah, a couple of times. Enough that I kept going until they kicked me out. I offered her the unopened beer, but she didn't notice it. I think I want to dive into your ego for a swim. Do you hear it calling? Eleanor asked, her hands constantly scratching. I didn't answer. It didn't matter as she had already taken the first steps towards the blob. The cop seemed halfway between panic and joining her. I just chugged down the beer and felt electricity spark under my skin. What did it matter if none of it were real? Hey, Eleanor? I watched as she walked slowly to her doom. Did you mean it about it being a good dick? She kept moving forward. You are no Jimmy, Ursa. I couldn't argue that, bastard. Instead, I shrugged my shoulders and said, Blobber, she's extra spicy with meth. The purple swirled towards Eleanor curiously, or whatever lights inside of a blob of carnivorous goop tend to do. Ma'am, I wouldn't go near that thing. The cop said, but his heart wasn't really in it. He seemed to have forgotten the body of his partner lying in a pool of various fluids. He still held his weapon trained on Blobber, although I think he may have forgotten that as well. You have to wonder what kind of fucked up trauma makes these kinds of visions. I didn't know I knew enough about human anatomy to make such a realistic image. If it were a vagina, sure. I could likely make a field of happy little vaginas, dripping dew that sparkles under a cartoon sun. I could hear that song about tiptoeing through the tulips played in my head. Man, how long has it been since I've gotten laid? What year is it? Blobbert sent out two tentacles, and I was surprised to see them pause tentatively, as if examining Eleanor. She reached out and touched one of them. To my surprise, it didn't melt through her hand. The other tentacle wrapped itself around her stomach and I flinched, expecting to see her be torn in two. Blobbert surprised me again. It gently lifted her into the air and she let out a giggle of pure joy as it swooped her about like a toy airplane. The look on her face was ecstatic as Blobbert finally grew bored and pulled her into the center of its mass. The smile never left her face as her skin grew translucent. I watched her nude form stripped bare of flesh, just striated muscle that began to fade away. Her breastbone was exposed and soon her heart beneath. I stared in awe as her heart beat in time with the lavender flashes. Then Eleanor simply ceased to be, the last wispy remnants of her becoming one with the blue blob. This is Officer Hernandez, requesting immediate backup at the Shady Holler Mobile Estates. Officer down. Suspect is a, um... Sentient glob of space nut, I added, hoping to help. The officer just stared at me, panic in his eyes. I don't know what it is, but it has killed two. Four people now, and an assortment of critters, and Mr. Winkles. Again, just trying to be helpful. Sir, is this creature yours? Officer Hernandez asked me. I laughed at the silliness of the question. Does anything living truly belong to someone else? Blobbert and I just met, but I think we are getting to the friend stage. Blobbert? He seemed confused as he asked, which I got. These are confusing times, no doubt about it. First thing that came to mind. It doesn't seem to mind, do you, Blobbert? The sound of sirens grew louder and I realized most of the park had come out to see the commotion. Cops being called out was nothing new. A blob-eating people was. 
I could just imagine one of the scumbags getting a chance to be on television, explaining to the attractive and thoroughly disgusted reporter, giving pithy anecdotes like, it sounded like a freight train, or some other such bullshit. I just wanted to be entertained. I am going to shoot it. Officer Hernandez said calmly, It has a name, and I don't think a bullet can hurt Blobbert anyway. It literally melts people. He looked at me and I saw a lone bead of sweat run down his forehead and right into the corner of his eye. He didn't even wipe it away. I think it wants to eat me. I nodded. For sure, that's what it does. He looked ready to cry. I want it to eat me. I nodded again. That is what seems to happen. Pheromones, maybe. I didn't do well in biology. And I might have skipped the day they talked about alien ejaculates that rained from the sky. That didn't seem to ease his mind at all. I have a wife at home. How will the guys explain this to her? I patted his shoulder and he flinched. Any kids? He shook his head. Well, fuck, Officer Hernandez. And maybe it's the window pane or joints or the beer or that hit of meth talking. But I think you should go with your heart. You really think so? He asked softly. Dude, I am in that trailer right now, covered in piss and possibly vomit, sweating my way through the greatest trip anyone has ever had. Fucked if I know what you should or should not do. Hell, I knew three or four of the people and I didn't do shit to help them. I don't even know you. He looked at me plainly confused, but shrugged his shoulders and set his feet in a firing stance. Blobber, this might tickle. He means to shoot you with the metal thing in his hand. Blobber just kept slithering forward, though the lavender seemed focused on Officer Hernandez who looked at me and said, Tell my wife I loved her. I seriously doubt I will do that. He sighed and sighted down the barrel. I didn't understand that. Blobber was the size of a trailer at this point. I think a missed shot would say a lot more about the officer's ability than proper stance and sighting, but who the fuck am I? The shot surprised me, so loud and too close for my liking. I watched through my flinch as time dilated and I could see the air displaced and the bark of flame from the barrel as the bullet came sliding out. It spun clockwise and the smoke was pulled along with it leaving a chemtrail through the night. I don't know what I expected. Maybe it would enter the mass of goo and I could see it even more clearly as it lost momentum before being spat out onto the street. I didn't expect Blobber to burst. The bullet seemed to slide syrupy across the distance between us and Blobber, and as it pierced the outer layer of jizz and broke the surface tension, Blobber exploded all over the street and trailers with a wet slap. I'll be goddamned, I muttered, the disappointment clearing my tone. I did it. I'm a fucking hero, Officer Hernandez shouted. I just felt a profound sadness at the loss of a friend. I turned to Officer Hernandez with a heavy heart. You're no hero, just a fucked up allusion to my checkered past or something. A figment of childhood trauma, and you have some blobbered on your face, asshole. He looked at me angrily. I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, sir. But you're coming into the precinct. Near as I can tell, you allowed four murders and stood around doing illicit drugs as they happened. You are just as guilty as the blob. Its name was Blobbert, you fucking pig! I shouted at him. The splash of Blobbert on his face twitched. I stared at it, willing my friend to be okay. My eyes grew wide as I saw it twitch again and a little flash of purple glowed on Hernandez's face. Then the goo drained into the corner of his eye. One second it was there, the next it seemed to be absorbed. Interesting. I thought about those little fish in the Amazon that swim up streams of urine and make their home in some hapless idiot's urethra. I leaned forward and Officer Hernandez glared at me. That's when I saw something sliding just beneath his skin. I smiled. Have you ever read about those fish that climb into dicks? 
The next thing I knew, I was on the ground and my head was throbbing. Hernandez rolled me onto my stomach and I had my hands cuffed behind my back before I could spell pig. He reeked of fear and sour sweat as he leaned down and whispered into my ear. You are going to fry for this, you piece of shit junkie. I painfully rolled onto my side and spat blood onto his polished black shoes. He reared back and kicked me in the stomach, and the last beer came gurgling back out of my throat. It got on his shoes too, cocksucker. Not so fucking smug now, are you? He sneered. The fish swim up the urine stream and into the urethra where it makes its new home. <laughs> it's supposed to be excruciatingly painful, I wheezed. He crouched down to look into my eyes. You think I give two tugs of a dead rat's cock about fish in the Amazon? Or anything else a lowlife piece of shit has to say? I smiled. Not really. I just wanted to see what Blobbert was going to do. I hope you didn't piss it off, seeing as how you have some alien super spunk roaming around in your skull. For a moment, Hernandez looked ready to punch me. Then I saw a muted flash beneath his cheek. Hernandez let out a scream like a wounded animal, and his joints all seemed to pop, and his limbs became pinned at odd angles. I felt something slither down my forearm, but with them clenched behind my back, I couldn't tell what it was. Probably blood. I spat on Hernandez as he lay vibrating in a St. Vitus dance. A strange mule and wine seemed caught in the back of his throat. Then the cuffs snapped open and my arms were suddenly free. I rubbed at my wrist to restore feeling in my tingling hands and saw blobbert residue on my skin. I panicked for a moment as I waited for my skin to melt, but the goo just oozed off of me. I looked around in relief and saw all of the dripping pools were reforming. I pushed myself up and pulled out my smokes. They better not be broken, asshole, I said to the twitching broken officer before tapping one out. Bent but serviceable. I lit it and felt the smoke rush through my lungs, the cherry on the cigarette leaving tracers in the air. Still tripping. Good. Still not real. Thank you, Blobbert. We are officially friends. That's when shit got gross. Hernandez's skin began to really start moving. Have you ever seen them put hot dough in a fryer at the fair? It goes in flat and lifeless, and within seconds it puffs and browns. Or when they make pork rinds? That's what his flesh began doing, swelling with large, quivering pustules. Poor Officer Hernandez was not seeming to enjoy himself. His face distorted, and he looked like that redhead in the movie with Cher, the one with the lumpy head. What the fuck was that called? Mask? Eric Stoltz, real tearjerker with that hot blind chick. Sis seemed to undulate in various states of being all over his exposed flesh, and judging by the way his clothes stretched, it must have been a full body reaction. Imagine your blood is Pepsi and someone injected your arm with pure Colombian pop rocks. An orgy of chaos that erupted in time to the silent symphony of lavender. Blobbert was conductor and musician, and Hernandez was the instrument of sublime torment. I didn't want to keep watching, but I could not look away. It was like when Melvin got out of the barrel of toxic waste, the pink tutu grafted to his mangled flesh as he hid in the junkyard and became the toxic avenger. I threw up for the third time as Blobbert expelled itself from the swollen pores along Officer Hernandez's writhing form. It was like 10,000 pimples popping at one time. That viscous blue spunk oozed in long strands like Play-Doh being pressed through a nozzle. It was a feat of reverse bukkake on an entire body quaking scale. The skin burst and the last of the alien load drizzled back along the street and putrefied innards, a smoothie of grotesquery, spilled from the ruined husk. I looked at Blobber. The flashes of lilac seemed nearly mischievous, and I smiled. That was fucking gross. There are a lot more of those guys coming, probably with bigger weapons. I looked around at all the people standing in front of their homes, staring in horror at my friend. What in the fuck is that? 
I heard from behind me, and I swear I heard the shouts of a thousand ruined burgers carried by that voice. I turned slowly to see the nemesis to the art of grilling himself, Chris, standing behind the police car. Come around the car, I beckoned. I didn't have to look to know Blobbert was doing its thing. I could see as Chris's jaw went slack and began to shuffle around the cruiser. I pointed and he looked down at the fetid remains of Officer Hernandez and began to gag. That is the equivalent of the last cookout you threw in human form. You're a goddamn disgrace to grilling. Chris argued through gags. Well done is perfectly acceptable. I laughed. Four cruisers and an armored looking something, an armadillo with fiery red eyes maybe, came screaming into the park. Chris was walking towards Blobbert and I had the sneaking suspicion this was about to get ugly. Blobbert began to grow agitated again. The flashing lights reflecting off the trailer windows made it swell up again. A tentacle whipped forward and grabbed Chris by the legs. A second speared him through the skull, with the pop of a cantaloupe dropping off a balcony. As Blobbert spun Chris's dead body a few times before hurling it into the first cruiser. You wouldn't expect 250 pounds to make a car shudder like it did. The windshield shattered and the impact snapped Chris back and nearly in two as his legs broke the light array. The cops poured out of the armadillo in black gear that screamed dangerous with bigger weapons that made me a little nervous. They aimed at Blobbert but seemed to ignore the fact that I was standing between them. I raised my hand slowly. Um, hi. I'm Ursa, and I am directly in the line of fire. The big glop of blue tinted death behind me is Blobbert. I turned slowly towards Blobbert. Don't be shy. Say hello to the nice men with implements of murder. I swear Blobbert waved a tentacle. Then the world exploded around me. They unloaded round after round that did exactly what I suspected earlier before the space blues decided to be clever. He has to be my ID. There is no way my ego could be that clever. It went on like the crescendo to a 4th of July celebration, as I ducked behind a squad car and covered my ears with my hands. Then it was quiet. I heard the cops reloading their weapons and the sound of metal hitting the asphalt as Blobber spat out the bullets. It's actually really sweet. It doesn't like mean people, or ones that run perfectly good hamburgers. But other than that, it's pretty cool. His name is Blobber. I called out to the cops, and then I heard a strange concussion of air. A smoke trail raced towards Blobbert and bounced off and began rolling towards me. I looked inquisitively at the odd-shaped ordinance as it wobbled closer. My eyes grew wide as I realized exactly what it was and I scrambled up and over the hood of the cruiser right as the grenade went off. I felt gravel and dirt tear through my legs, but I couldn't see the damage through the smoke that drifted from the crater. I realized I couldn't really feel my legs besides the lacerating waves of agony that swept through me. I felt cold and realized I had partially exploded. The smoke cleared and I saw a blobbert flashing at me as dark circles overtook my vision. Tentacles wrapped around me and I knew that this was the end of the form of my consciousness. Blobbert would consume me, and maybe I would finally wake up in my trailer with some cheesy B-movie from the 50s playing loudly in the background. The tentacles lifted me gently in the air, and I felt myself slide through the outer membrane. It tingled in a not unpleasant way, and soon I was floating painlessly in an ever-growing blob. I took a tentative breath of the goo and was shocked to find I could breathe it in like amniotic fluid almost. I wondered if that would speed up the process, allow Blobber to consume from the inside out as well. The purple flashed through my paper-thin skin as I watched, waiting for it to grow translucent, but it didn't. Tendrils began to blossom from my ruined legs. Bone grew like one of those frozen fingers of ice that slowly tickled its way to the bottom of the ocean. My femur stretched out, 
then my kneecap and the two that make up the lower leg. I could never remember which was which, tibia and fibula, my ankle, and then the little bones that made up my feet. I hung, a half-formed fetus in a wound of dancing lights. Veins and arteries snaked like vines as muscle and then flesh formed. My clothes melted as Blobbert knitted my flesh back together from the various injuries that had seemed minor in comparison to getting my lower half obliterated. I felt better than ever as the drugs filled my mind and joy radiated against my flesh. I wondered if when absorbing things, Blobbert gained an understanding of them as they melted into its central mass. Did it have a vast accumulated knowledge of beings we could never dream of? The lights that swirled around me suggested so. I just couldn't decode the message. Then I saw that Blobbert had given me an upgrade. One magnum-sized dong flopping happily between my freshly grown legs. Things were looking up. I curled up tightly and Blobbert decided to fight back. I couldn't fathom how I was floating safely within the tentacles that skewered and dissolved two cops. Blobbert moved, but I could only tell by the wreckage accumulating outside. The more he consumed, the larger he grew and the safer I felt as my eyes grew accustomed to the watery view. One of the cops in riot gear panicked and began to run. Blobbert sent a spike that tore straight through the poor bastard's ass with enough force that his stomach and now inside-out esophagus wrapped around it. I saw trailers knocked over and wondered how long I had spent nearly catatonic. The armadillo was flipped upside down and besides the lights flashing in the distance, that seemed to be the last of the police. Blobbert slowly oozed down the road, out of the trailer park, and paused as if uncertain. I pointed towards downtown because why the hell not? There I sat, reclined in cubic gallons of space semen, watching the end of the world play out like I was in a movie shot from the creature's point of view. The membrane of my screen to a landscape of destruction that I had a feeling was going to be magnificent. Until the drugs wear off, that is. Julia never remembered her dreams. At most, she'd come back with discrete images that couldn't be cobbled together into a narrative whole. Images that would rebound within her memory banks for, at most, several hours, then dissipate to wherever faded memories went. Then, at some point, her attempt to recall them would give way to speculation and conjecture. She was in a dream now, she knew. She was gently making her way down an azure blue river. Her aunt and her friend Venice were with her, which was weird. Why not her mother? She found herself questioning the premise of this dream. Why Venice? Was Venice her best friend? Already, the fabric of the dream was tenuous, as she saw herself from the third-person perspective, alongside her aunt and Venice, noting to herself the incongruent angles of the river and the unrealistic color of the raft that carried them. When you became aware of a dream, that's when it would end. She felt the bobbing of gently moving water beneath her and looked down at the orangish wood. She was impressed with the granular level of detail in the wood, in the construction of the raft. She knew nothing about handiwork, but she could tell this raft was professionally constructed. She was impressed with herself, that she even had a frame of reference within her to recognize a well-crafted raft. She let her fingers drift in the water. She distinctly felt them submerge and instinctively tightened her bladder. Dreams of water meant you were going to pee the bed. She rubbed her fingers in the stream, convinced any minute she'd wake up with a warm, damp bed. Her aunt and Venice mouthed words, but what they said was a mystery. What? She thought, and wasn't sure if that thought made its way into the dream. Her aunt rocked back and forth. She wore black, which was typical of her. She didn't see Venice below the waist. It was definitely Venice, tall, gangly Venice, large equine mouth and facial features, curly black hair. 
The rendering was impressive. She made out the impressions of Venice's pronounced teeth and wondered if she had internalized Venice's insecure impression of herself. Venice spoke softly and indistinctly. Julia turned her head to see a large, humanoid creature stand up beside her. It was pale green, long, lean, and well-proportioned. It was gilled and scaled. Five hook-shaped claws on each hand, blubbery webbing connecting each claw to the other. Its face was indistinct, like everything else, except its mouth seemed too far back, sprung back almost, but claws forward, as if its claws were the antenna it used to navigate the world. Julia, I'm here to help you. Come with me. I'm here to help you. The impression of shaking her head. Come with me, Julia. Come with me. The webbing of its claws split, and new, scythe-like claws emerged continuously, a conveyor belt of sharp angles and scaly blubber. She shook her head, whether in the dream or in real life she didn't know. Venice and her aunt were gone. I do not know what your mind is making me look like to you. I apologize if I appear frightening to you. Its breath, or perhaps just its presence, was sulfurous, redolent of damp disease. Her dream jump cut to a memory of when she opened what she thought was an empty drawer at her aunt's house and found the corpse of a mouse in a sticky trap, its bottom still plump but covered in its own musty droppings, its upper half feeble and emaciated, a hint of pink color for guts. That smell when she first opened the drawer and realized what she was looking at, that's what this reminded her of. She was back to her dream reality, still on a moving raft, but with just isolated details, nothing that provided a larger impression of her environment, as if her brain didn't have the processing power to create a coherent background. When she took her focus off something, it disappeared. I don't look like anything. I don't smell like anything. I don't sound like anything. That's odd, she thought mildly. She liked the sound of its voice. Masculine, but in a non-threatening way. Everything you perceive, that's just your brain creating a projection that it wants you to believe is true. But it's not true. I don't look like what you are seeing. The creature reached its arms out, palms up, claws up, long as rakes. So long that they didn't make anatomical sense. How could a creature that lives in the water possibly have claws the size of rakes? I am here to help you. I will not make you do anything. I will give you a choice. As much as a choice is possible in your reality. You did not choose any of your urges, preferences, or limitations. You did not even choose to be in this sleep state. I am here to tell you that I offer you a painless exit out of existence. The fetid smell had become overpowering. There was the heavy heat of unwashed body, bacterial buildup. The reeking scene jaundiced all the creature's words, smothered all else. The tinge of genuine sympathy she detected now gone, curdled beneath her base revulsion. Of course, your brain wants you to survive and reproduce. That is why you feel pain when you get hurt, to let you know that there's trouble, to get you to avoid those situations so you can survive and reproduce. Your brain, your nerves, your senses, they don't want you to listen, for I do bring death. I bring you the escape from pain, from fear. Your brain will let you feel the pain of disease, of cancer, of decay. But I am here to tell you something else, something your own body, your own mind, will never reveal to you. In your reality, there is no such thing as a painless death. When you die, your brain reacts to get you out of whatever situation is causing your death. 
To your brain, it is like your finger is in boiling water. It sends the signal to tell you to remove it. But now imagine your entire body is in boiling water and there's no hope of escape. That's what death is. It's the feeling of your own system in pain, cannibalizing itself. All that pain, you feel it. Time is subjective. The pain lasts forever. It swallows everything you ever did and every memory you ever had. All life ends in a tide of pain. And as your mind controls your perception of time, it's a never-ending tide. The soaring, uplifting chug of Bear vs. Shark's Ma Jolie flooded her brain space. The dream snapped, and she was awake. It was the dead of night. All was still. Ma Jolie was her favorite song, and she'd adopted the opening chord progression as her morning alarm. She checked her phone. It hadn't gone off. She checked the time. 4.27 a.m. The night was long and still. Try as she might, she was unable to fall back asleep. Man, Julia said when her three best friends were all seated around the lunchroom table the following day. I used to be jealous of people who could remember their dreams. Not anymore. I had the most fucked up dream last night. Claire, Venice, and Lynn didn't jump immediately at the bait like Julia had hoped. They were still adjusting themselves, putting their book bags under the seat, and readying their trays around the table in the outside courtyard. It was chilly outside, but they had warm down jackets and had braved the cold to at least sit outside and get peace and quiet from the loud, obnoxious cafeteria and the table-spanning, shouted conversations. They were all 16 and halfway through their junior years at Lakewood High School in Shrub Oak, New York, a middle-class, undistinguished suburb about an hour north of Manhattan. All of them came from families who had uprooted themselves from New York City with hopes of securing themselves a piece of the suburban American dream, decisions made by New Yorkers who lived their formative years in the 1970s and 1980s when New York City was a metonym for urban disorder. Now, of course, New York City was a locus point of gentrification, and the suburbs were steadily and rapidly absorbing the fallout of the recession. Each year, it seemed there were less and less places to go. The odd, inverse relationship of more people, yet more shuttered businesses. The local Jefferson Valley Mall had just, for example been placed on the Dying Malls website. All four of them resented losing their New York City birthright, and for what? The drabness of the suburbs with none of the supposed benefits. Suburbs weren't safer, if you thought about it. More teenagers die from car accidents than gunfire. Venice took the bait first. Venice was the tallest of the group, six foot one, with long, curly raven hair, a stud tongue ring and belly button ring, a toothy smile, and a subtly elongated facial bone structure that made her resemble a horse. Not really in a bad way. She was pretty and fit and equine in the same way as Julia Roberts. Out of the group, the boys were perhaps most interested in her. Some combination of her fit body, her big mouth, her erotic name, and the halo effects of her belly button and tongue rings, which created associations about body image and sexual proclivities that were entirely incidental. So, what was it about? Venice asked. A long conversation with a monster about dying. Sounds pretty cool to me. Yeah, Lynn joined in. Your plea for sympathy is hereby rejected. I am officially jealous. My dreams are always boring. That last point wasn't true, not recently, but she let the comment stand. Lynn was bundled especially warmly in a green, cozy-looking knit sweater, which was appropriate for her. She had big, clunky brown glasses, and the fact that they made her look geek-chic sexy was purely adventitious. She was short, pert, and peppy, 
about five foot five and a natural blue-eyed blonde, with a mane which she kept long and well-mannered. Under alternative circumstances, meaning if you knew nothing about her personality, one could easily imagine her as a cheerleader. Yet, no one acted like that was true. Years later, classmates would reminisce about her and talk about how cute she was and ponder how odd it was that it seemed like no one ever dated her. Instead of social climbing or dating, she applied that natural pep and go-getterism to doing well in school, fastidiously finishing tasks, getting OCD about her favorite musical genres, emo core and upbeat pop punk, and making sure her much younger sister got the proper exposure to books and culture. Yeah, sounds like a humble brag to me. What did the monster look like? Was it cool looking? That was Claire, in between bites of overcooked, droopy school pizza. I guess so. It smelled really badly. I was impressed, actually, that my mind could render something like that. I didn't get a good look at the background, though. Claire was the only one of them who had a boyfriend, which wasn't what you'd expect. She was pleasant and innocuous, an affable wallflower given to bouts of social anxiety. As if form met function, she had a mousy look, with matted-looking brown hair, average height and average weight, and a curiously sedimentary, layered countenance, kind of rough and porous, with an atypical bone structure. She had a tendency to sniff her food before eating it, although she only did that in front of her close friends these days. She spoke with a slight lisp, which felt right given the intangible curiosity of her face. To boys, she was a nice, pleasant presence, as she had that air of non-judgmental obtainability about her. That's perhaps what led to her being the only one with a boyfriend. Although, truth be told, the other girls weren't too concerned about having boyfriends. Claire's boyfriend, Isaac, fit in nicely to their group centrism, as he was two years older and busy with Westchester Community College and his side job doing light carpentry work for his father. Isaac, when he was around, was an unobtrusive presence, a nod of the head, a filled seat on the couch. I had a crazy dream too. I just can't even remember it. I just remember thinking it was crazy. It's weird because I've been reading a lot. Claire pulled out a used paperback, Stormfront by Jim Butcher. It's cool. It's got a lot of monsters and supernatural stuff and wizards in it. So I'm disappointed I didn't have a great, vivid dream that I remembered. Usually when I read, my memory gets sharper. I'm jealous. You must be gifted. You sounded so cute. If you were a hamster, I'd just want to take you home, said Lynn. Wizards. She did her best approximation of how Claire lisped the word. Thwithards. Venice exaggerated it, using deposited saliva and her tongue ring to great effect. I love it. How can you be reading that? Venice looked at the paperback. Oh, I've been meaning to read that, actually. Heard it's good. But how you're reading that before Hitchhiker's Guide is a crime against the universe and a personal insult to me. Do you even still have it? I'll get into it, I promise. You have to make good on your promises. Your cute lisp can't save you forever. She's done pretty well with it for 16 years, Lynn deadpanned. She perfected it before she could even speak. Julia deadpanned back. They all took pleasure in teasing each other for lapses in logic, malapropisms, and the like. One time, Julia pronounced automaton as automaton, and Lynn had a field day. I know, that's what makes it so effective. When you can master something before you even do it, that's the only way you can really be called a master. You can only be a master if you can perfect something before you can even do it. An illogical but airtight quandary. Airtight. Viciously airtight in its ill logic, which makes it all the more effective. They went on for a bit with this inspired nonsense. They could riff off each other all day. They had enough rapport, in-jokes, and meta-references for a Wikipedia entry. They talked and ate, 
with a couple callbacks to the lispy noises and the foolish mastery paradox. Julia ate the peanut butter sandwich and apple she brought from home and enjoyed the company. Julia found herself at the same lunch table under almost identical circumstances. She unwrapped her lunch and again it was a homemade sandwich, same coarse brown wheat bread, same shiny red delicious apple. She unwrapped the sandwich out of the tinfoil and bit into it. It was chewier, smushier than usual, with an overpowering texture on one side and abrasive crunchy pieces on the other. The fractious mismatch of textures made chewing difficult. She opened up her sandwich. It was, literally, peanuts and butter. Half of the bread was slicked heavy with dairy butter. The other half was a deposit of whole peanuts. How could this be possible? Under no circumstances does someone say, Hey, I made a mistake. Instead of peanut butter, I used peanuts and butter. Under what sort of haze would someone have to be in to literally take out ill-fitting, cumbersome, solid peanuts and tuck them into one side of the bread, and then slop on a gag-inducing amount of butter onto another side of bread and smush the two pieces together? She opened up the sandwich to show her friends, as prima facie evidence that something was wrong. The thing spoke for itself. None of her friends seemed to notice or comment on it. My dreams have been weird too, said Lynn. Lynn was probably the sharpest of the four friends, so Julia was interested in what she had to say. They are interesting though. I'm interested in them and what they have to show me. Julia hmmed. That's an even-keeled attitude to have, she thought. She was speaking to Lynn without seeing her, she realized. She did her best to look at her, but couldn't conjure up a vision of what Lynn looked like. As if in consolation, a show of defeat, she associated her with a green, warm-looking sweater and tight black pants. Was Lynn wearing the same green shirt as yesterday? No, she didn't really wear tight black pants, but they'd suit her in her subtle way. That wasn't fair, she thought. They were sitting around the table, but no one else was eating. When she wasn't looking at Lynn, she seemed to disappear. No one was talking. Maybe James and his group of friends who shared the courtyard with them were doing something interesting and distracting. James' group and their group were cool with each other and sometimes met up, went to local music shows to see the same shitty local bands. She turned, and there was nothing behind her. Literally nothing. It was as if she had turned her head to witness a Nivea stain with the intensity of a supernova. Her subconscious stirred slightly at the thought of a brief, frustrating fight with her mother. She'd said something mean and impatient toward her mother, more out of hunger pangs and frustration than anything else. But how did that make sense? The timing was all wrong. This was lunchtime. She was at school. Venice spoke while two hands emerged from her mouth, each hand pushing her jaws in opposite directions. Her longish face became even longer. Her chin descended at least an inch, and her mouth jutted forward, giving her a hook-like shovel face. She didn't scream or react hysterically, but her voice abruptly cut out. The upper part of her face bulged out narrowly, like the beak of a bird. The top of a figure emerged from her mouth as her body crumpled and broke off around her. That's not right, Julia thought. Venice's body should be gore and viscera, blood everywhere, a horror show. Instead, the top half of a figure just stood upright through Venice's baleen mouth, unfolding and ascending upward into a standing position, like a seed rapidly germinating into a flower, rising from the flower pot that was Venice's impossibly solid and overstretched jaws. The figure fully emerged and Venice bloodlessly broke off and tumbled away, like detritus thrown overboard on a moving ship. This is another dream, the figure told her. It was silver and featureless, 
just the outline of a human shape. The dimensions didn't make sense, but it was bigger and vaster than she was. You are dreaming. I'm not here to hurt you. I apologize for however I look to you if I frighten you. Your brain perceives me as a threat and will do whatever it can to make me seem threatening. Just as it comes so naturally to you to assign negative attributes to spiders or snakes, your body does the same with me. Just remember that the spider or snake is not evil. It just is. And your brain communicates what it needs to communicate to you to keep you living and procreating. Your brain, including the parasites that control it and the forces of natural evolution, does everything within its power to convince you to procreate and extend your genetic legacy. It does what it does. It's a program. I am here to offer you a reprieve from living and procreating. No living thing can ever know whether life has been worth living without first experiencing the sensation of dying. No one who has ever died can testify to the experience of dying. Left to your own devices, your brain and existence as you know it will not permit you a quick, painless death. There is no such thing as an instant death. Pain is subjective, controlled by your brain. When you injure yourself, your brain transmits pain to provide you a reason to stop or avoid the injury. The sensation of dying is every nerve, every fiber of your being, being twisted and scorched under the incorrect assumption that transmitting the sensation of pain can cause you to avoid harm. And since the mind controls how you perceive time, death is every nerve and molecule of your being flayed in perpetuity. Your brain is just a system. If there's a fire, your fire alarm, when triggered, will go off. It responds to stimuli. It will go off even if there's no conceivable possibility that the fire alarm will stop the fire. It just reacts. Your brain will react when you die. Every human being who has ever lived and who has ever died has regretted their life. For the sheer pain of dying blots out everything that came before it. Do not fear me. I am here to help you. You speak well, she heard herself saying in the dream. It stopped speaking. Thank you. How much of this is real? Nothing of what you are seeing or feeling based on your perceptions is currently real, but everything I am communicating to you is real. Hmm. She was no longer in the courtyard, but instead in some blank, undistinguished mass of space. The figure was no longer visible, just a charged presence. Are you a robot or a spirit? Do you have a personality? It is interesting that you are more interested in me than in what I am communicating to you. My history or story is, cosmically speaking, of no significance. I'm here to help you. Why should I trust you? And why have you selected me, by the way? You are perceptive, intelligent, and acutely sensitive enough to allow me entry and to listen to what I have to say. There are hundreds of millions of others who share this quality who, at the right stage of mental or emotional sensitivity, we reach out to save. I can do nothing to prove to you that what I say is true. I cannot interact with you physically. I can only detach your mind and free you. Well, okay, that's all well and good, but maybe you can come back when I'm older and sick or something? When I'm dying? Despite what you may think, I'm actually relatively happy. I like my friends. I like that I'm still young. Things aren't so bad, even if I act like they are. I understand. I do not dispute anything you are saying except there are only limited mental or emotional time periods when you can receive our call. And, 
however much pleasure or fulfillment you extract from your life experience, on net, the transaction will always be a terrible one. If you could do an accounting after your death, my position would be vindicated. Of course, that is not within your power. I just bring to you information. There would be no pain or fear of suicide. It would just be a transition into exactly what you were before you were. That's interesting. I hope I'm able to receive these messages, say, when I'm old and dying and a burden on my family. I don't have any objection to assisted suicide, given certain circumstances. I think it's a person's right to decide when and how they die. There was no response. She feared that what she had said sounded small-minded and childish. She always felt that way when expressing political opinions, even though she was fairly confident and adamant about this position. It just seemed misguided, minuscule almost. He was talking about something grander, cosmic. He? Was it a he? More like an it. Finally, it spoke. And if I'm wrong, there's nothing for you to fear. You will be in the same oblivion, absent the pain and ordeal. I couldn't do that to my family, at the very least. They'd be so sad and upset. It would devastate them. There was a pause. Everything you are saying is true, given your perspective. And it is the great difficulty in this that you are not privy to the knowledge I possess. That is not your fault, though. It's not within your sphere of understanding. Unfortunately, it is only a truth that can be learned upon death, and upon death it is a moot point. All I can communicate is this. In death, there is no shared experience. Your family and friends will not endure the experience or the pain for you. These concepts of family and the values you associate with them are nothing in the face of death. They are useful concepts during the course of existence, but disappear as if they never were upon the commencement of your death. Hmm. Privy. Privy. That's how the word was pronounced. She was hazily familiar with that word. She'd never pronounced it before and never, she believed, used it in context, but she was confident it had been used correctly. Maybe she had that information tucked away in her subconscious and the dream had dredged it up. She loved believing that dreams acted as mental sifters, rooting up trivia or a factoid and allowing them to waft gently into the working canals of her conscious brain. Tell me a word I don't know, or allow me to speak another language. If I could wake up tomorrow speaking Italian, I'd believe that this was something beyond a normal dream. Sagacious. I know that word, I think. I can't define it, but I associate it with, like, a deer? I don't know why, but I have an association with that word. She realized her dream was no longer visually interesting. It was just a dark void filled with voices. As if on cue, the figure before her was now an austere, noble-looking white elk, adorned with gleaming antlers that looked like smooth Amazonian vines that had calcified and hardened into sheer bone. Nostomania. An intense homesickness. Hmm. Nostomania. Interesting. I like that word. I don't think I know that one. I don't think I've ever heard it. I'm impressed. Just so you know, yes, I am looking that word up immediately when I wake up. So, do you have, like, all the information in the universe? Are you a god? Are you god? Frigorific. Producing cold. That's a cool one. Frig. Frigorific. It sounds like a fake word, like a fake curse. Cold, hmm? Homesickness. Cold. Is there a pattern I'm detecting here? Her palms were sweating. 
She didn't like that it was complying with her request, whether because it was going to prove itself correct or because she felt she now owed it something she wasn't sure. You know, just because you tell me SAT words doesn't mean I'm going to believe you. You know that, right? If you're so wise, you should know that. I do appreciate them, though. I must have read them somewhere and am remembering them now, though. Thanks for telling me about them. Her sweat accumulated, pooled in her armpits. She was marinating in it. It passed through her insides and poured out forcefully between her legs. She felt its unwelcome presence by her ankles. Even in her dream, she felt inconvenienced, knowing somewhere she was going to wake up to something unpleasant. An inkling of a passing suggestion that the elk was transforming into something else only reinforced the wetness beneath her. She woke up with a start. Right on time, her bladder was close to bursting. She made her way, bow-legged, to the bathroom, making sure to close the door so as not to wake up anyone with the light. It was sad, she thought through fatigued reverie, that the dream was over. There was a hidden world inside her, worlds and experiences and an imagination that she always coveted but never felt she possessed. But it was there, down below, waiting to be unleashed. A world inside. Assuming, for the sake of argument, that her guest had been real and not just a dream, then its plan had backfired. She was more excited about all the potential that life had to offer than she'd ever been. She liked the interesting presence she'd conjured and looked forward to meeting it again. Still, she wasn't particularly eager to fall asleep again. She blamed it on the heat in the room, but made no attempt to toggle the temperature. And, of course, she looked up those two words, nostomania and frigorific. They were real and had been defined correctly. She was impressed. That was one feeling she could identify. She'd rather not investigate the other feelings. Julia breezed through school the next day. Her classwork was simultaneously more interesting and less interesting. More interesting in the context of how this was part of the wider world beyond her experience and what lay beyond was so interesting, and less so in that this classwork was, well, classwork, busy work, inconsequential, removed in its way from reality. Questions about, say, trigonometry were symbols of the deeper world, fascinating in helping her to contemplate an entire universe of theories and connectedness she knew almost nothing about. But this school wasn't the wider world. School was just a holding pen, teenage daycare. She made no mention of her dreams to her friends at lunchtime, except by illusion. Lynn and Julia were both in Miss Shaw's composition class, and Lynn was complaining about the essay Miss Shaw sprung on the class, which she required to be completed over the upcoming weekend. Frigorific, Julia replied. Frig, Lynn parroted. She liked the hard consonant sound and thought it was a cute word Julia had made up on the spot. It felt appropriate. Frigorific, I say! It's frigorific, I say! Julia continued. Hmm, okay there. No more coffee for you. You've had enough, said Lynn in her understated way. Or your crack. No more crack for you. Sleeping pills, maybe. Cough drops, sure. Why not? What harm could they do? She shrugged off her irreverent goofing. Later, when the whole group was together, So, did anyone have any interesting dreams last night? Venice, Claire, Lynn, they all drew a blank in their own patented way. Shrugs, noncommittal faces. We failed, the whole lot of us, said Lynn. Thanks for thinking I could even have interesting dreams, though. I have something to aspire to, added Claire. The downbeat way she said it either made her joke more effective or more harrowing. Then, save us? pleaded Lynn. Venice shrugged. 
We used Venn diagrams today in class, and one time I dreamed people were calling out my name, and then I was somehow stuck in a Venn diagram, like I'd become one, because, you know, Venice. Got it, Lynn assured her. Failure all around. So yeah, who knows? Maybe I'll have an interesting dream tonight. But other than that, nah, got nothing, Venice concluded. Julia didn't know what to expect, or if she'd tell her friends anything about her dreams, unless one of them had shared something eerily analogous or equally hyper-specific. The underlying subject of the dreams would be of casual interest, perhaps most so to Lynn, but she didn't feel like entertaining arguments or even discussions about it. This was her thing. She sat on the floor of the dream cave, Indian style, looking up in rapt attention. She knew it was a dream cave because why else would she be in a cave? And why else would the floor appear as nothing more than an inorganic shade of monochromatic light blue? And why else would she be in a cave that had none of the trappings of a cave? No dust, no grime, no darkness even. She could see fine, everything bathed in a soft, lambent light. There was no indication even that anything would be descending from the ceiling. Yet here she sat, prone and waiting. An immense arachnoid shape descended from the unseen ceiling and appeared before her like an ever-stretching monument in a gilded city. Brobdingnagian, her dream self thought, means marked by tremendous size. It descended patiently but inevitably, like the New Year's ball. She was naturally afraid of spiders, but felt no fear. In dream sleep, she'd learned, the perception of size meant nothing, but even with that knowledge in mind, this was perception-altering. Its carapace and abdomen alone were both leagues taller and wider than her. Each of its eight legs was longer than she, even though there was no reliable form of comparison, for each leg was not actually a leg, but an ethereal projection of a loved friend or family member. Her mother, Venice, Lynn, Claire, a boy named Max she had affection for, her aunt, who she didn't like that much but who was inexplicably present yet again, her first grade teacher, Mrs. Sullivan, forever her favorite teacher, and her dead grandmother, Bernice, all extending outward from the spider's body and wafting like rooted underwater plants. She didn't have the mental bandwidth to recognize and appreciate all eight projections at once, and she suspected they disappeared, reappeared, and changed their order as she exerted herself in making sense of them. Her grandmother in particular was unusual, in that Julia had no working memory of what she looked like when she was alive. She died when Julia was only five. While the other legs were fluid and dynamic, like ghostly projections. Her grandmother's was rigid and flat, a brown wall projected behind it. She recognized the image. It was a picture of her grandmother that her mother kept on her nightstand. As she looked at the projection, she felt herself inhabit that old space, the musty smell of mothballs and unsavory hard candies, the brown wall cut with three shelves of knickknacks. She could tell the shelves were occupied, but had no idea with what. The spider lowered to her level. Its carapace was beautiful and sleek, metallic, appropriate for the antiseptic crystal space. She didn't fear it. She gasped as it flexed its legs, saw the projections of her loved ones adjust, images changing their aspect ratio. I've been dreaming about you she said, a line that was funny and ridiculous even to herself. I'm afraid of spiders, but your appearance is different. If this is my mind trying to make me afraid of you, it backfired. The spider lacked the mandibles, the grubby, crawly sense of alien otherness that made people itch and slap at themselves in disgust. This was more like a crystalline spider ornament, an aesthetic monument to their ability to captivate. 
it had not yet spoken to her. I'm glad you returned, she offered. Yes, I am glad you do not fear me. Your subconscious mind recognizes what I represent on some level, so it will always inspire you to fear me. I want you to show me. I don't, I don't know how to say it, if there is a proper way to say it. I want to follow you wherever you're willing to lead me. I want you to show me. This episode of Horror Hill is brought to you by Mint Mobile. Well, folks, if you remember from earlier, we spoke about the old bait and switch, so to say. Surprise fees and overage charges on a plan that's supposed to be unlimited. All those extra fees can add up over time, and the money spent there could be better used on other things. So don't be the frog. Mint Mobile is here to rescue you with premium wireless plans for just 15 bucks a month. Say bye-bye to your big wireless plans, jaw-dropping monthly bills, and unexpected overages. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data, delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. What's more is you're able to use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number, along with all your existing contacts. That's premium wireless service, including unlimited talk and text for only 15 bucks a month. What's stopping you? You worried about your poor current provider? Don't worry, they'll find someone else to rip off. But how's the service? Well, it's fast 5G, great coverage, and unlimited talk and text for a measly 15 bucks a month. My advice to you folks is simple. Give Mint Mobile a try. You'll get the best rate available, whether it's for yourself or your whole family. And at Mint, family plans start at just two lines. To get your new unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash horror. That's mintmobile.com slash horror. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash horror. Thanks for your support, and for supporting our valuable sponsors. The enormous crystal spider shape hung motionless. Its eight projected legs continued shimmering. She noted in a microsecond passing that the legs lost focus and blurred whenever she focused on expressing herself. I am happy to hear that, but I must tell you, I must make you understand. I am not here to show you anything. You will not be seeing anything. This is not an adventure I'm taking you on. Your brain repels me and makes you fear me because it wants to survive to reproduce itself and its genetics, despite the personal cost to you. But part of the nature of your brain, your very being, is influenced by what you've experienced. Your culture prioritizes adventures, journeys of discovery. You think this is what is expected of you on some level. This is not a journey of discovery or self-knowledge. This is not a journey where you will learn about yourself. This is the end of your existence. I am offering you only the escape from the inevitable experience that awaits you, the most excruciating agony that awaits you. That is all. I understand, she said. I don't believe that, but I can only work with what is. In this dream, this image you have created, you are staring up at me in awe. The size differential is influencing your decision making, making you genuflect before me. I do not want you to be unduly influenced. Your type submits and becomes obedient to differences in height and perceived dominion, 
and I do not want that coloring your decision. But perhaps it is inevitable. I understand. Thank you. I have made up my mind. I want to follow you. I want to go with you. I trust you. I'm excited, and I'm curious. There was no way to calculate time in dream sleep, she knew. A narrative sequence spanning years in dream sleep can occur in the objective length of a second. Yet still, even knowing that, she felt time passing and passing without a response from the great figure before her. Finally, after what felt like hours, it spoke. I am certain that you are making the correct decision, although perhaps not for the right reason. I am certain that, if you could live out your entire uninterrupted life, experience the agony of natural death, and then situate yourself in this position again, you would understand why this choice was the correct one. My hesitation, which you may suspect, is because I want to make sure you are making an informed decision. Even if it is a correct decision, it is my obligation to ensure you are making an informed decision. If you agree to this, this is the end of your existence. I want you to understand that this is the end of your existence if you follow me. She nodded slowly. There was a rumbling excitement within her, an eruption of elation, of grand virgin vistas. Her nerves flared up in panic, but she suppressed it, pushed through it, and smothered it. There was again a long delay. I am confident you are making the right decision. She closed her eyes. Inside the dream, she thought, as her eyes were already closed in the real world and allowed her guardian to lead her into the dark of her mind and into the dark of the void. If this were real, it would be amazing. If it were just a dream, she'd wake up and have more fantastic dreams to dream. Claire sat in English class. This was a senior class, late in the period and late in the school year. In essence, this class would have no bearing whatsoever on her or her colleagues' academic futures, and they acted accordingly. The class, separated into five distinct groups of about four or five students each, spent a couple of conspicuous seconds of conversation on the assignment at hand, and then shifted to talk about practically anything else. I just... Claire trailed off and forgot what she was talking about. Henry, a casual friend and classmate, kept his head arched, ready to nod and be understanding. Henry was a nice, calm, Chinese-American student who planned on attending the University of Binghamton, as did she, and as did a fair portion of her graduating class. Since they would both soon be attending the same college, she figured it'd be helpful to get to know him better, since she may be seeing him around campus next year. I just... I totally blanked on what I was saying. You were? He paused, hoping that maybe she'd remember on her own accord. You were talking about Julia's... Funeral, right! Julia's funeral! Oh my god, I can't believe I forgot that! That's so weird! Claire had tracked every day since Julia's passing, and did not want to contemplate a time when she didn't keep up those efforts. There was a high-pitched female laughter beside them, the oh my god kind, that jolted her like a next-door gunshot. Anyway, um, any big plans this summer? Are you going to Corey's party by the lake this weekend? The end of senior year was a democratizing season, with a built-in reference point for different cliques and groups to hang out. She wrote, Wuthering Heights... Reasons on her notebook in big, bold letters in case Miss Harrison walked around checking on them. She crossed out reasons and didn't know why she wrote it down to begin with. She breathed heavily and looked back up at Henry. He was gone. His chair was moved back a space as if he'd made room to get up and leave. 
She looked around to see where he went and didn't see him or the classroom door closing or anything to suggest he'd left the room or had even ever been in the room. She looked over in Venice's direction to make sympathetic eye contact, a general get me out of here face, and wondered why not just walk over there. It's already pandemonium in here. No one's paying attention. She never got Venice's attention. Beyond lies the wub puts the wub in Wuthering Heights. It's about a pig, said Suzanne, a classmate in her study group. Did anyone else find it so creepy when the pig's head is on, like, a platter and is still talking to the main character? That freaked me out. That picture freaked me out. That didn't make any sense, but okay. Claire was nodding slowly and empathizing. I remember I read this story once when I was in, like, in junior high, in a collection called Beyond Lies the Wub. I thought it had something to do with Wuthering Heights for some reason, or maybe it was the same thing. I didn't know. All the stories were illustrated, and all I remember about that story was that there was, like, a detailed picture of a hog's, like, decapitated head. It scared the shit out of me. It's so funny you mention that. She turned to Suzanne, who was wearing Henry's face, stitched atop her own. It didn't fit over her face properly. Had anyone told her that? The incongruity of Suzanne's lush blonde waves over Henry's inscrutable, dried-out face was too much for her. She almost laughed, but contained herself. How did Suzanne speak so clearly while wearing Henry's face like that? Crinkly holes were carved for her eyes, but not the mouth, which retained Henry's usual blasé expression. Suzanne raised her hand, didn't receive any response, and walked up and left the class, bringing what remained of Henry along with her. She imagined Suzanne in the bathroom, employing lotions in vain to get that crinkly skin mask looking smoothed out. Julia was sitting in front of her in Suzanne's seat. Julia was here. Adrenaline surged inside her, sending everything around her into a whirling paroxysm, like a violently tossed fishbowl. Julia was still there when her vision stabilized. Julia, this couldn't be. This was a dream. The surge of emotion made her perspire, and the whole classroom heated up uncomfortably. She felt herself with her hand and felt a down black puff jacket. That's why it was so hot. She thought to take it off, but didn't. Julia? What are you doing here? Julia looked like she always had, she sensed. A dim outline of her mottled brown hair, rounded moonish pale face, the brown dots of freckles and the red clusters of stubborn zits. Claire identified that pimple. It was a nasty one she'd noticed on Julia the last day she'd ever seen her alive. A lot of juice is coming out of it, Julia had complained. But at least it's apple juice, she'd joked. The memory of that quip reverberated on the school's loudspeaker so everyone could hear it and smile and laugh. The pimple expanded into its own world, lifting Claire out into the galaxy when it ruptured and she slid down the expulsion of pus like a toddler on a toboggan. I miss you, Julia, she said despite herself. She didn't have a lisp when she spoke, she noted, again despite herself. She didn't care about that. She knew what this was. This was a dream. Where's Isaac? Why isn't he waking me up? She pushed herself to flail her arms to force herself awake, but she remained in the dream. I know you aren't real, Julia. I know this is a dream. I'm not trying to make you believe this is anything but a dream. The voice spoke to her. She knew that voice. It had been the voice that visited her innumerable times, even in her daydreams, whenever her conscious mind wavered. The voice had always remained patient, understanding, and reassuring. It had explained all about the nature of pain and how Julia, wisely after deep consideration, chose to unmake herself rather than await the indescribable agony that awaits us all. 
It spoke about how Julia one day just no longer was, and how this was a decision of her own making. Don't feel bad for her. Envy her. Julia had passed in her sleep without medical explanation. No furtive drug habit, no shocking heart attack or brain aneurysm, no unknown allergy, nothing glorious, poetic, or valiant. Not even something gory or tragic, but at least understandable, something for which an emotion could be attached and understanding processed, other than whatever emotion or understanding lurked in the aghast, torn space Claire felt in the pit of her stomach. Confusion. Dread. Bewilderment. The space was the cousin of anxiety, churned the way anxiety does sent its tendrils throughout her system the way anxiety does. But it was not anxiety, just the absence of something. I hate you, she said to the voice, even though she didn't really mean that and was just speaking stupidly. I hate you. You took her from us. If what you're saying is true, you took her from us. She was my best friend. She had a family who loved her. Did you know that? And now she's gone. She'd had this conversation so many times and already been through the range of emotions. She reached her hands out to hug Julia's neck. Julia's head tipped forward and fell hard to the floor like heavy luggage, though it made no sound. Roaches and black bugs crawled from the impossibly proportioned spigot that was Julia's neck. Claire screamed without sound, averted her eyes and closed her palms. There were no bugs. Julia was sitting there again, head and all, undisturbed. You know that does not make sense. That is your brain trying to scare you off, trying to upset you. It is reaching for the horrific, what it thinks will scare you, disgust you. You know this. She looked back at Julia, which she knew was where the voice emanated from. Claire had been through denial, been upset, furious, depressed, overwhelmed, and even at times felt contented and felt something like acceptance. If what the voice told her was true, then Julia was in a better place, non-existence. She'd avoided the pain of natural death, the voice assured her. No one who loves anyone would permit them to experience a natural death. Having her alive for her company while subjecting her to the possibility of a natural death was, in a sense, selfish. Claire didn't really believe any of that, not really, but it was a nice thought to think her friend had made her own choice, made what could be the correct choice, that her choice created meaning and understanding to fill or at least create the semblance of something that could fill that pit in her stomach. If it's good enough for her, well, it's good enough for me, Claire said to the voice in a half space of resignation. She said it just to say it, almost as if on a dare. The paroxysms, the violent distortion of adrenaline-soaked anxiety, tore at the fabric of her dream for a moment. Julia had been lucky the voice explained. The vast majority of people were on a different mental wavelength and could not receive these overtures. In a sense, then, she was lucky too, since here she was. I mean it. She doubled down her provocation. I do not believe you mean that. As much as I think it would be in your best interest to believe it, I'm not sure you do. No, I do. I've had enough of this. I've had enough of this wondering. Her voice sounded faintly contemptuous, even to herself. If she was awake, she'd be sitting cross-armed, curled into herself, steaming in a little tantrum, thinking, fuck everybody else. I want to experience what she experienced. I want to know. You do not understand. There is nothing to experience. I offer you the absence of experience. 
What you will eventually experience otherwise is the unendurable, never-ending pain of your own natural death. I don't want to talk anymore. There was an edge in Claire's voice, even though this was nothing but a dream. I believe you. I've met and spoken with you so many times. I believe. I accept. You wouldn't be so persistent unless you were real. You wouldn't know what you know unless this was real. Otherwise, this is just all fake, my crazy imagination, in which case I'll just wake up. So here I am. If what you're saying is true, then I believe. Take me with you. She extended her hand and struck a pose of concentration and acceptance. I grant you permission, every permission you need. I believe you. I believe. My brain, my impulses are hardwired in the interest of the species' survival, but not my personal interest. See? I understand. I believe. I accept, okay? I accept. She extended her hand more forcefully, her look now of determination. Julia took her hand and held her close. There was no classroom, just them, outside, in space. This space is the pit in your soul, the emptiness you feel, Claire felt, and panicked. She had buyer's remorse before the thought was even expressed. Wake up! Where's Isaac? Piss yourself! Shit yourself! Wake yourself up! Isaac, where are you? I told you to protect me! She had been impulsive and didn't want this anymore. She pulled back, and before even running was an option, she was already making her way toward the door of the classroom. Claire turned around and saw a Julia of distended limbs and joints launching toward her. Claire was trapped between her limbs now, encaged underneath them, and Julia's goopy neck cascaded down in front of her. Her head flipped back, upside down, revealing her face of ridged teeth. No. Embrace this. I want to be awake! Isaac, where are you? You granted me permission. You made the right decision. Shut off what your brain is telling you. There's nothing to fear. A distended limb ending in the shape of a sharpened asterisk shot out and held her arm. She was trapped between stalk-like growths. The only exit was occupied by Julia's distorted death face. A force gripped her throat, and soft pads closed over her larynx. There is nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. Her mind was not assuaged. Every cell in her body revolted, flush with hot terror. Isaac, where are you? There is nothing to fear, said the fearsome face, a cacophony of sharp, threatening sights, repugnant smells, and unsettling, booming explosions. There is nothing to fear. Your mind has not realized it has lost. You are free from it. There's nothing to fear. This is just your conscious mind's last spasms. This is nothing compared to what you'd experience upon your natural death. All was nothing. Venice pulled into the parking lot of the small shopping courtyard that contained JV hot bagels. It was 8.30 a.m. on a Saturday in December. Other than the post office, JV Hot Bagels was the only business she recognized. She'd only been upstate in college at Albany for a year and a half, and truth be told, she'd never been super observant. But only recognizing two stores was... something. A sign. A good sign? A bad sign? Maybe a sign that this place was behind her. She didn't know. It just felt like something like moving on. It was winter. Lakewood High School was not in session, so it wasn't surprising JV Hot Bagels was empty. The only other customer, a mustached, overweight, middle-aged man in a New York Giants beanie, gathered his brown bag and gave her the look-over, as most men did. 
She was inured to it, didn't bother her except when she knew the middle-aged man in question, like if it was a friend's father. She didn't know this guy, so what? Kinda icky, but whatever. She was taller than him and liked being taller than most men. The door opened, she heard the little bell, and he left without incident. She ordered what she had always ordered when she was just another high school regular, pumpernickel bagel, toasted, vegetable cream cheese, and a coffee, light on the milk and sugar. She was serviced by the owner, who recognized her, and she made small talk with him. He was a nice guy, late thirties, gelled hair and muscular, attractive in a typical way. Rumor was he slept with a couple of the girls who worked here, but for all she knew, those were just rumors. And whatever, it's a free country. She told him about what she was majoring in. Undecided, she said with a smile, but leaning toward double majoring in business and sociology. And he said something about that being impressive and ambitious, as if college wasn't just a bullshit way station between childhood and adulthood. She made small talk about how she liked Albany and got along with her roommates. Yeah, she'd gotten lucky on that end. And how the school lived up to its reputation as a party school. I bet, he said, which he'd certainly said a hundred times before. She took her brown paper bag and said her goodbyes. She decided to eat outside, despite the dry cold. Nostalgia required a cold environment, she thought. It wouldn't feel right in a place like Florida, where the warm weather is beckoning and life-affirming. Nostalgia warms you up in a certain way. It requires gray cold and hot coffee and local restaurants and blue giant beanies. She could see the edge of the high school from here. She looked at the high school and reminisced without active thoughts, just about her time there, her friends. There were no real feelings to unearth. It's not like anything was buried here. No dramatic emotions. Just the sad reminders of loss. Lynn would be back in town next week from RIT, which Venice was deeply looking forward to. As college went on, they'd seen each other less, but for valid, expected reasons. Their respective schools were a solid three and a half hours away from each other. They'd made their own separate friends, and Lynn was an engineering major, so she actually had to study during the school year, especially come finals time. Venice hadn't seen Lynn in about six weeks, actually. There's that obligatory gravitas about being back in town, but hopefully they could enjoy their free time together without too much painful reminiscing, and hopefully each year onward would get easier and easier. She put the too hot coffee in the drink holder, started the car with her right hand, and snacked on the still hot bagel. She pulled out of the parking lot and thought about pulling up to Lakewood, but didn't. That would be too sentimental, and she really wasn't that type of person. Just thinking about pulling up to her old high school was enough. She drove down the main road and passed the turnoff for Mohegan Lake. She stayed in the right lane, even though everyone rushed into the left turn only lane just to cut everyone else off at the light. It didn't bother her. Everyone in town knew about this annoying light and this annoying behavior. It was kind of unifying. She was multitasking, driving, texting, eating, furtively finger checking on her coffee cup to see if it was drinkable yet. She should have grabbed a coffee sleeve. She was about 10 minutes away from her parents' home off Curry Street. She had a boatload of movies and television shows to catch up on, a ton of extra coffee to drink at home, and absolutely jack shit else to do. Ah, to be home. She got a hearty scallion chunk in the last bite. Mmm, that was good. Her phone vibrated. It was jammed right against her coffee. She clamped down on the coffee lid to prevent any from spilling over. She checked the message. Brenda, a friend from college who lived in her dorm. Usual gripes about being back home. Emoticons and empathy. Continued buzzing vibrations, the red flashing light of her phone out of the corner of her eye. Crumpled bag, smeared on its edges with cream cheese. The phone between her legs at a traffic light. 
a long, hopefully final text until she got home. The coffee was good. She was glad he put in too much sugar. Starting on the second half of the bagel, car engine kicked a little bit, some pullback, whatever. Rushing to make the right on the yellow light, another insectile buzz from her phone. She checked to see who it was from, turning to make the light, ignoring the uncomfortable sting of the coffee that now dotted her hand. Turning, that oncoming SUV was retarded. Fucker should stop and wait for her. It didn't. Nausea overtook her. No, that wasn't right. A moment of dreadful anticipation. A pivot point that lasted a millennium. The SUV plowed head-on into her Kia. The metal mousetrap of her surroundings ruptured and exploded, roaring, folding into itself, a ship collapse in perpetuity. Coroner's report. She died instantly. Roland, six years old, didn't want to go see Grandma Linny. He didn't like the way she looked and the way she smelled. He hadn't seen her for almost two months, ever since she had gotten sick and been in the hospital. He visited her in the hospital once and didn't like it. He didn't say anything about it, just kept to himself and didn't talk. Grandma was nice and usually gave him toys or gifts, and if she did something he didn't understand, his mom and dad would always let him know she did something nice by saying, oh, isn't that nice, and he'd feel comfortable about it. He was going to visit Linny in the hospital. He was dressed in a dark suit and tie that everyone said was so cute and charming, but was a little itchy and he didn't like everyone watching over him. He went with mom, dad, and his older brother, Kale, who was ten. Kale was acting like the big boy and telling Roland to be on his best behavior. Roland already planned on being good and even letting grandma pat him on the head and kiss him. It took them a long time to get to the hospital. Roland liked looking out the windows. He liked cars, was fascinated by them. Grandma Linny grew up near New York City, a place he'd never been, but he knew there were brightly colored taxis there. The most famous were the bright yellow taxis, Grandma told him. Then there were also bright lime green taxis, she told him, that went to the less crowded areas. And now, there were bright purple and bright red taxis, too. And there were trains that went underground, where all different kinds of people rode together. He wanted to visit New York and see the taxis and the trains, and see the big, famous toy stores and candy shops and eat ice cream. He lived in Delaware, and he didn't know why that was funny, but he heard people saying Delaware was funny and, no New York... When he got older, he'd go to New York City. His aunt and uncle and relatives lived somewhere in New York, on an island, but not a fun island, an island that looked a lot like his town, except maybe more crowded. They were going to meet them at the hospital, too. They all crowded into the hospital room. Roland played by counting them all. One, himself. Two, his brother, Kale. Three and four, mom and dad. Five, grandma, who was mom's mom. But maybe she didn't count? Okay, then five, Aunt Josie, mom's sister. And six, her husband, William. Seven, eight, nine, Josie's children, Auden, Alden, and August. All in this one room. He was the youngest, and everyone paid attention to him. But he liked to stay quiet. His grandma Linny seemed very tired. She always seemed sort of tired, and one time he said she should get more sleep, and she said something, and everyone laughed. But now she looked really bad, really thin, and her eyes were dark-colored. She just didn't look good, and he didn't want to tell anyone, but he was scared she would get him sick. He was brought over to hug and kiss grandma Linny. He felt bad that he was scared to hug her, and he felt bad that she must have realized that. Kiss your grandma Linny, his mother said. Linny loves you and you love Linny, don't you? 
He did love Lenny, and he didn't mean to be scared. He knew she wasn't well. She was old. She was in her 80s, which was an impossible idea. He wasn't even in his 10s yet. She had been alive eight times as long as his brother, which was amazing. He'd said it was amazing once, and everyone laughed. That laugh he'd liked. He knew that Grandma Lenny was special. She'd been a successful engineer. He wasn't sure what that was, but it was hard to do, and you had to be smart for it and read a lot. Plus, engineers worked on trains and helped build cars, although she was not that kind of engineer. Plus, plus, Grandma Linny made Mom, and Mom made him. He hugged Grandma Linny and ignored the musky smell that reminded him of his dog when she was wet and sick. Linny was covered in a smooth, plastic sheet, kind of like the way his toys came wrapped. This sheet helped to keep her well. She had fallen recently and hurt herself and gotten really weak. He didn't know much about it, but she was sick inside. He knew that things disappeared when they died, and that Lenny would probably disappear soon. I love you, Roro. You're going to go on a boat someday, and you promise to say Roro for me? He nodded into her shoulder. He'd already been on a boat. People had asked him to do that, and he'd done it, but he'd do it again. He had never gone on a boat by himself, so he could make that promise to do it by himself one day. She kissed him on his head, but it didn't feel like lips on his head. It felt like a pencil eraser. It was so rough. He didn't say anything. He thought they would spend a short time there and leave, but they stayed for a long time. At some point later in the day, his dad and uncle came over together with some of the other kids and asked him if he wanted to go to a toy store for a little bit. Mom and aunt were going to stay behind. He wanted to be a good big boy and stay with Grandma Linny. He felt it would be a good thing to do, but they insisted and he said okay. They tried to excite him by saying he could get anything he wanted, and that was exciting, but he didn't know how to feel about it and stayed subdued. It would be the last time he saw Grandma Linny. Few could be this lucky. Her husband had not been so lucky. Her dear, beloved Anthony passed six years ago now, a heart attack. He passed with no one around. I'll be joining you soon, my dear, Lynn told herself. She was surrounded by her daughters, her beautiful daughters, the lights of her life. Her large, loving family, her gifts and testament to this world. She held hands and kissed and embraced. At her age, death was a constant. Even as a child, she remembered, death took her three dearest friends. Two of them, bizarre freak occurrences. How else to explain two young girls dying in their sleep? Julia and Claire. She remembered them. Claire. Quiet, clever Claire. So clever, so quiet so reserved. Smarter than she'd let on, didn't talk much because of her lisp, she remembered, but still the first of the group to have a real boyfriend. And Julia, sweet Julia. It pained her that she couldn't remember much about Julia other than that she had passed first. Venice, her other young friend, was in a terrible car accident a couple years later, while she was home from college. How tragic. Venice, such a beauty, such a beautiful name, such a beautiful girl. So tragic, so terrible. She remembered a period of consoling dreams she had, where she told herself that Julia and Claire had died peacefully, painlessly. She'd been asked, crazily, to join them. But no, no, she wanted none of that. She'd been scared of death then, as was to be expected as a teenager. She wasn't so afraid anymore. She'd lived her time. She'd lived a good life. Well, girls, I'll be joining you. And joining all her other dear friends who'd taken the next step in the adventure. She hoped she'd join them as teenagers, 
or else they could greet her as adults of advanced age, as if they hadn't been taken so abruptly. Voices now sounded like she was underwater. Her daughters were sobbing, clutching each other, trying to be strong but failing. They consoled each other. They spoke as if she'd already passed. I'm still here, you silly dearies, she thought. But perhaps not. Perhaps this was passing gracefully. She thanked God for painkillers and all the sweet doctors and nurses helping her. Such nice people. All the nice people throughout her life. All the fullness she'd enjoyed when others had been taken so tragically. She drifted off. She lived 82 years on Earth. Between the synapses of her dying brain, she'd live a millennium in agony. Beneath the sedatives, she felt a disruption. Placid, warm, comforting water, boiling in an instant. Hey, Bole Versaman, she thought insanely, a word she didn't remember ever hearing. No, hearing in a dream. One of those crazy dreams from her youth that now came back to her with its full, wretched meaning intact. That's how she'd described death to herself in a dream, after her friend's own deaths. But that was stupid crazy talk from so long ago. Help me! Help me! Dear God, help me! She reached out, pinioned herself, clamoring against the wall of oblivion encasing her. God, help me! Help me! Help me! She screamed for her family. Fuck you, you ungrateful pieces of shit! You worthless bitches! Help me! Help me! She reached out in vain, but nothing was moving. Every fiber of her being, pinpricked, aflame, virulent, eyes gouged out. Everything organic and important gouged out. Kill the children! Kill the children! She screamed against the perpetual, all-consuming pain that all men and women experience upon the precipice of death. The pain that causes them to forsake their loved ones and their lives work for even just the barest chance of reprieve. Take Kale! Take Roland! Take Auden! And as if this knowledge had always been there, as if she had always known who she'd sacrifice first to make the galaxy of pain crest. She wanted to feel the sensation, tear Roland asunder, wretch him with her hands, to transfer the bilious suffering from her to the form of another. She'd tear Roland in two with her bare hands to make this stop. She'd squeeze him until he exploded, rive him into stumps and pieces. Anyone, please... God, oh God, please, anyone else, oh God, please, please, please. This can't be right. This can't be it. A flooding of experience and pain commanding her to escape, to flee death. But it's impossible. She's an animal being cooked over a flame, with every fiber of her being broadcasting the pain as an incentive to remove the spit. A lobster in boiling water with a pot jammed closed. Oh God, oh God, oh God! And even that's what she intended to think, but it was nonsense. Gibberish. The drugs did nothing. There was agony under the fog, Gibbering, incessant, liquids of acid and organs of twisting thorn. God! God! A scream that renders throats a pulping mess. All her years spent on Earth resulting in a perpetuity in a boiling fishbowl. Help me! Help me! Oh, help me! Fuck you for doing this to me! Fuck you! Fuck you! Please, God, help me! Fuck you, fuck you, do something, help me, please, God, anyone, please, God, anyone! With great sympathy, the doctor consoled the grieving kin. It's the best anyone could hope for. She was well-loved, well-cared for, heavily sedated. 
she went peacefully. And yes, yes, thank God for that. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.